Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of the Guitar Souls podcast. This is episode number 108 and I am one of your hosts, Mr. Levi Clay, and I am here with my good friend, Mr. Mike McLaughlin. How is it going, bud? Not too bad, you handsome bastard. How are you? Yeah, yeah, doing good, doing good. We're having um we're having lots of positive guitar souls related things happening, which mm-hmm. um, you know, nobody can complain about. We are I think we're going to be shooting off a message to a friend of the show probably just after we do this recording to talk about filming or sorting out a new video intro mm-hmm. for the podcast, which will be which will be great because um yeah, we know someone that does some great work. That should be a lot of fun. And uh we should in theory be announcing a new partnership really? over the coming over really? the coming weeks, which hmm. is which is kind of kind of cool. It's all right, yeah, yeah. It's definitely, definitely, definitely cool. And of course, we couldn't do that without your love and support, guys. So thank you so much for watching the podcast, listening to the podcast, engaging on the Monday Night Guitar Geek Club, because that makes things um, fantastic. Like it's it's a lovely community, and we're going to see that with a bit of fan mail that we're going to read out today. Um, yeah, couldn't do it without you. So thank you very much. And if you would like to help the show further. You can also head on over to buymeacoffee.com, um, link in the description, you can see it on screen now. Uh, yeah, support us over there, and um, yeah, get a bonus episode. Get bonus episode. Yeah, I was going to say episodes, but at this stage it's just episode. So but far. We should do another one soon. So, yes. Yeah, that'll be that'll be cool. Um, also, we, uh, we've just re-signed with a long-term sponsor, and not only is that going to be great for the podcast in terms of um guitars and gear and having things we can talk about i also hear it's gonna gonna result in a nam trip so, so something like that yeah potentially yeah, yeah that's um that's pretty cool and exciting but um maybe outside vi- of that maybe a visit to australia at some yeah, point too yeah. <laughs> perry said he might give me a shot at the ferrari <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe that <laughs> that's the most important thing is getting a shot at that damn ferrari isn't it or the other car when it's built yeah <laughs> oh yeah, yeah perry don't think i fucking won't remember what you said in the chat mate i'm telling you <laughs> Um, how about you? How's life been? Keeping busy? Yes, constantly busy. I started my new job the other day, hence why I wasn't at the Guitar Geek Club on Monday. I popped in to say hello, but that was all I could do. Um, very good, thank you. Yep, my first 48-hour shift. Got to meet the young people, spend a bit of time with them, get to build a relationship with them, find out what their routines are like, um, and a couple of challenging moments that were... Uh, first shift challenging moments. Nice. <laughs> Always going to be challenges, but the, yeah. the good thing is that I'm par for the course. Do you know what I mean? I'd rather that than sure. go in and be lulled into a false sense of security that everything's all calm and normal. But uh, really good, thank you. Yeah, really good. How are you? Yeah, keep keep busy. I um I sent you a wee video of me playing Reflection on the piano mm-hmm. because um because it's uh one of my favourite songs because it's beautiful. Some wonderful chord changes in there and. Uh, <clears throat> Again, just furthering this idea of like piano is pretty easy if you just sit and sit and play at it, just get comfortable with your chords and shit, and then I, I'm not reading things. I've just got a chord chart in front of me and I'm bashing along and having a mim 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 bashing along and having a sing song. Just enjoying yourself. Which um yeah yeah absolutely just just I think that's key, isn't it? It's what we were talking about last week. Just enjoying enjoying yourself is key. Um, totally. Are you still doing your um sponsorship with Piano? I am. Yeah. That be... So for anybody that's not jumped on that and is interested i think i'm actually going to do it i'm thinking about it as it if did. i don't have enough things to try and fucking juggle <laughs> but i'm thinking about it yeah. um it because definitely I would, helps i would love to learn the piano yeah it's um it's just not that that de- uh, you know i was gonna say this to um i saw someone on twitter um somebody that i follow on twitter saying that one of their regrets in life is having not learned a musical instrument and they'd love to be able to learn the guitar or learn the piano um now that I'm, this person i'm talking about is in their mid-30s so it's, you know it's, it's nowhere near too late to start because it's never too late to start a musical instrument um, and to be inspired by the thing that you you love doing um you know i talk about piano and stuff but i'm again inspired by guitar because guitar excites and in- inspires me too um in fact why don't i use that as a as a little way to to bring up a little a wee teaser um of something and just just grab this for everybody i don't even know what he's going to tease us yet So, oh, let's um, oh, oh look, look at this. See, hybrid guitars put up a a wee post from their uh, oh, and my uh, guitar might be in there somewhere. Yeah, I wonder what one it might be. My guitar is, is, I wonder which one it might be, is in there somewhere. So, um, not at the back. Well, I mean, I'd, I'd take any of any of these yes, stunning would, looking instruments. I'm pretty so. certain, knowing you. 
I know what you've asked for. <laughs> oh, they look amazing, man. I'm so chuffed for you. So yeah. is that... Are the necks built separately? Do they get built to the guitar? They're built to the guitar, yeah. <clears throat> right, so, cool. So, yep, yeah, I have got a seven-string hybrid on, on build. Uh, and, wow, Christ, what what's their scale length? I think they go from 32 to 27. Wow, so you're still leaving extended range at the treble side? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because it isn't tuned up to, to high... Isn't tuned up to guitar tuning. It's, mm-hmm. it's still lower than lower than guitar. Tuned like a pedal steel kind so, of thing. Um, no, no, fuck no, no. no. It's m- way lower than that. <clears throat> it's tuned down to uh, tunes down to a G, as in the third fret on the bass guitar, mm-hmm. and then tunes up to. Uh, it goes up to like our B string. Oh yeah, so ridiculous amount of range on them. So super cool, and um, looking forward to getting my hands on that. You wanna? Because, you know, guitars are cool. All guitars are cool. Everybody should go and buy more guitars. Speaking of which, did you know? This show is brought to you by our friends over at Ormsby Guitars. And I want to let you guys know that now is the time to get involved on their upcoming Run 16 guitars. Now, there's some incredible guitars here available for your money, starting as low as $1,400. That is an incredible price for some cutting-edge guitar technology. Starting up first, we have the Run 16 Hype GTRs, available in a variety of colours, 6, 7 and 8 string models. You can also get your hands on a Metal X, again in a variety of colours and different string variations. You can also purchase the Metal V Headless, which is my choice of the bunch, absolutely stunning, especially in that Dragon Burst. Absolutely beautiful instrument, super cool, imagine that in an 8 string, you know you want it. And then finally, we have the Hype 6 GTR Ando San Signature Model. Again, another Hype GTR available in 6, 7 and 8 string models. As I say, these are available with starting prices of $1,400 US dollars, which is an incredible price. But if that's a little too much for you right now, you can get involved on an interest-free payment plan and beginning that at just $375 Australian dollars. That's an incredible deal, guys. If you like the look of any of these guitars, do not miss your opportunity. Now is the time to get involved. Anyway, on with the show. So as always, a huge thank you to our friends and family, and it, I keep saying it, family, but it very much feels like a family. Mm-hmm. Um, those guys are so good to us over at Ormsby, and uh, it's really heartwarming someone like putting as much faith and belief in us as Perry has. Uh, and we, the only reason I can imagine someone doing something like that for us, because there's no way we can possibly be doing as much for those guys as they seem to be willing to do for us, mm-hmm. is that Perry sees us like his children. So... Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> Daddy Perry. Yeah. Um, as we said, we, uh, we've we been with Ormsby for a long time now. It's been two yeah. years. Actually, we went over um, what we had initially planned to do. Way over, of course, because we doubled up on episodes. We used to be doing the uh, podcast every two weeks. That's and every um, week. Yeah, we just completely lost track of time. So it was time to uh, time to talk to, to Perry and, well, there might be some more guitars involved. So, Potentially. Um, anything on that list? of upcoming run 16s that you'd be into one of each <laughs> one of each that's every your default single model, every single straight, dollar yeah nice. as I, I can't help it but because there's not a single thing that comes out where i don't go i would like to try that if not instantly like that is amazing i'm just i don't know i i, I need to have a deep think about it to see what i actually <laughs> want because i am um, i genuinely haven't even thought about it i've been so uh pre preoccupied with the reality side of life that sure. I forget that things can actually be quite nice. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, totally. Dealing with all the bog standard shit. <laughs> but um I definitely think a headless V. Yeah. Is it's up in the runnings anyway, man. Especially that the, the blue burst one is fucking gorgeous. Here's a real question for you. So um I had constantly been telling you um seven strings of the way for you. Mm-hmm. And now you're playing the uh it's the SX. Um, yes. All the time. Which is seven string all the time. So would you be thinking seven string? Yes. Yeah, of course. Of course I would. <laughs> Aye. Actually, that's. I even considered potentially getting an eight string just for the sake of having one. But the chances of me using it. I know, dude, I know exactly what you mean. I know exactly what you mean. I've uh, had one before and it was like, all right, kill, I've learned two after the burial riffs and I can't play any of sugar. Right, I'll just sit in the yeah, stand. Yeah. yeah I, as you know, I have an eight string over there with never tune on it. And it's it's great, but it's just not something I need. And therefore, it's not something I pick up all that often. And for me, like I, I do do 
you know recording stuff for people session type stuff for people um so i can always make the argument that having more instruments around having the access to lots of different sounds is totally beneficial for me mm -hmm. um but that's not you know nobody's like can you record this eight can you i need what i need on this is like an eight string guy <laughs> so that just does sit there and occasionally i'll pick it up and, and do some chugga chugga on it but yeah i think unless it's something that is going to be a big part of your actual usage probably probably not mm -hmm. that's what i'm thinking i think a seven's probably the right um compromise for me in terms of having the low end as well as having noodly noodly well i can't help but but suggest uh the goliath is uh Mm -hmm. You know, a headless V is is great, but it's still it's going to be a lot heavier than uh, than a Goliath, and it's. I don't. I think they're chambered. Just in terms of like shape, they're like rather unwieldy. You'd need a. Uh, they come in hard case, right? I Maybe don't it's... know what the headlesses are going to be like. Yeah, they might come in gig bags. But that's what I was thinking. Like you still got an extreme shape, but you've also got a guitar that's a reasonable size. Yeah, and I've got my Goliath already. I know, but, it's, but a seven string. Maybe even maybe uh, we custom finish. Mm. Lots of lots of options. Oh, behave yeah. yourself! You're getting me all excited here. I know, I know, but we should be excited. I know, I know. Um, and I know, I know exactly what I'll be get, trying to get my hands on. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to tell you guys, but um, Perry's not even announced that they exist, so um, I can't, I can't really comment on that. But uh, yeah, it's a big secret. Yeah, big secret. So please do go and uh, check out the guys over at Ormsby and let them know that we sent you because um, those guys are absolutely awesome, like beyond awesome. Also, would like to say a big thank you, of course. To Dead World Audio, thank you very much, Daniel, over at Dead World Audio, mm -hmm. D A E, the Duality DX. Um, so Daniel's got, you know how I got the amp off him? Yes, he's got it back at the moment, having a look over it and stuff, right. and uh, modding it for me further. And they sent me a wee video the other day of him <laughs> fitting a gate to it. Nice. So it's just going to be ridiculous, man. Yeah. Absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. I can't wait for it. I saw uh, on Facebook that he's uh, in that predicament that a lot of electronics companies are in where he's struggling to source semiconductors and mm -hmm. microprocessors and, too and the yeah. like. Yeah, um, which is I said it's a strange, strange situation for the world to be in, isn't it? Like mm -hmm. just this global shortage of semiconductors and, and microprocessors and chips, um, and it impacting things in in ways that you hadn't even considered. Like obviously, it's going to be heavily covid related um but you know you combine that with the shipping troubles that we're that we're having you're seeing the uh i'm seeing americans talk about um i was going to say you say gas actually but no talking about the cost of lumber in in the states like the price of wood is just going through the fucking roof um because they can't get they can't get enough of it um which tells me it must they must have been getting a lot of lumber from china um that's um, fucking scary, isn't it? Like, the world's coming to a halt. Yeah. I think a big part of the semiconductors and stuff as well, though, there was really bad floods. Yes. And that has affected, like, the um the computer memory, mm. like, uh, RAM and uh, hard drives uh, market, as well as graphics cards. Right. So the second-hand graphics card market at the moment is fucking wild. And yeah. I mean, like, double the prices they should be. Yeah. And people are paying over the odds for stuff. Like, right, totally. My graphics card, uh, I'm running a 2070 Super which I got last year, the year before, or whatever. Because um, I thought, fuck it, if I'm going to get an upgrade, I'm going to get something that's going to last me a long time. Sure. And I got a good price on it. But I could sell that for more than I bought it for Yeah. after having had it a year and a half. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> wild. That's wild. Yeah. No, I, I, I um, obviously not into the PC building side of things. Mm -hmm. But um, if I could pick up a second hand, uh, not a second hand, a second PS5, so I could have one downstairs and one upstairs, I'd be all over it. But, you know, you can't, you just can't, can't get one. Can't get one for love nor money. Cash is... generators are looking. They are getting stock in. You have to put your name and details in. If you actually want a second one. Um, my point, just to, to go back on it, see me talking about how my graphics card is now worth more than it was when I bought it. Sure. You know that I'm very stingy. I bought that brand new. <laughs> so for the fact that it's now second hand and worth more yeah, than it yeah. was when I bought it brand new is bewildering. Yeah. I also imagine, uh, especially with the PC graphic graphics cards, that's for uh, people that are now suddenly turning to uh, fucking crypto mining. A bit of that. Um, yeah. You know what? It's kind of like a, a an assault from all sides because there are other people who want to do crypto. What they usually do is they'll get a card that has a lot of video RAM right. and then undervolt it so it's not running hard, right. but it's just constantly processing. Sure. And then get it in like, the sweet spot where it's not burning the card out, but it's also not like bottlenecking or doing more than it needs to. Right. Um, in fact, not, not long ago, I saw somebody selling a mining rig of rx 570s um 
AMD graphics cards and it was about 20 of them mm. on a big fucking rail. <laughs> and I was like, I just, I understand why people would set up mining rigs if they've got the money to do it and they are making money. But uh, crypto is such a volatile, yeah. untrustworthy market. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people who are getting into it these days probably don't know about Mt. Gox or BitConnect. And those two names make me shudder. <laughs> are you aware of those? No, I'm not. I have no interest in crypto whatsoever. Mt. Gox was the biggest kind of online, uh, imagine like the bank for mm -hmm. crypto, and it got hacked. Right. And everybody's money went away. And then BitConnect was another one that was launching after Mt. Gox, and there was a big massive press release and a, a big event for it and all sorts. And it was a scam, and all the money went away. <laughs> it just seems to be that every single time there is a fluctuation in price on one of these cryptos and it goes up, somebody who's already rich makes themselves even richer and everybody else gets shot on. Well, yeah, the reason I won't ever, I should never say ever, but the reason I won't get involved is because any time I see anybody posting about it, they have an incentive to post about it. They have a reason to post about it because the more you buy, the more you get involved, the more what they have is worth. Of course it is. You know, so there's never there never feels like a genuine reason to get involved. Mm -hmm. I can't, there's always a kind of ulterior motive of people that are telling me I, I need to get involved. Yes. I mean, um, there's a lot of people who can make a lot of money. Sure. I know that Dogecoin's been skyrocketing left, right and centre, but that's also done to Elon Musk. I've also and seen my, people lose money on it though. Of course of they have. So. Of course they have. Yeah. And the people, people who lose thousands and thousands and thousands a day. Yeah. But the Elon Musk thing kind of sticks in my throat because I have no doubt whatsoever that as soon as that price hits per whatever, amount he's looking for as a target pair yeah. unit he's going to sell all his shares and it'll just plummet yeah plummet yeah rather than this to the moon power sure sure and anybody anyway. that's pushing it to the moon power it's because they have some investment and they want it to go to the moon so they need to build up hype around it i just I, that's not how economies work so i will yeah. um won't be getting involved in that thank you very well, much well i just hope that people who have bought it cheap who are not rich Make lots of money. Yes. And the people who are rich that might have invested get fucked. Because I'm a terrible human. <laughs> oh, did you see this about the Dawn Raid yesterday? No. Was, it, was it yesterday? Maybe the day before? Uh, on Eid in Glasgow and Pollock Shields? I, I did, yeah. So the Home Office turned up, obviously, immigration, um, and tried to take the man away. I mean, these people better have had fucking guitars, Mike. Go on. <laughs> Someone lay underneath that, yeah. the van for eight hours. yeah. yeah. I was just going to say class consciousness and solidarity is beautiful because not only were the, this person supposedly getting fucking uh, deported, there was that many people there peacefully protesting, just not allowing the van to move. They let him go and let him go into the mosque and get legal advice to find out what he's to do next. Fucking go in your cell, Glasgow. Go in your cell. <laughs> not seriously, though. Yeah. I'm not yeah. going to get into it, but yeah. good on yous. Yeah. So, I mean... Every every single person that was there will completely ignore the fact that there'll be an orange walk next week, though. So, in the grand scheme of things, well done, Glasgow. You're ignoring your biggest problem. Mm, I wouldn't put that on them. I would put that on the fact that the uh, the local councils and governments give priority. So the local walks. governments and councils allow it to happen, just like the government was allowing what happened to happen, and people stood up and said no. So, I think there's a big difference between trying to take your neighbour away in a van. Uh, on a religious holiday and intentionally des designing the hostile environment versus people celebrating the deaths of others if that's actually what it's about and for being, the most part be and being horrible and racist and violent and yeah oh no like I'm not, I'm not advocating I'm saying there are two different scenarios I would like it if people would be like well actually nah we're just going to block the street <laughs> but uh, that would genuinely mean bloodshed in Glasgow uh, yeah genuinely. which is why things won't happen which is mm -hmm. why I kind of I have to look at that and be like it is activism and I'm glad that the people are being active but like don't shy away from from all the fights go for the go for the hard ones and the and the easy ones yeah, well, yeah. make the I mean the, the, a big change just as a, a final comment then I think maybe the big problem is that police Scotland would be standing right in front of the orange order yeah and I don't mean to defend them yeah sure um okay let's read a couple of bits of fan mail so we're going to start the show today with a lovely bit of fan mail from Phil Cross who Old I'm sure mate Phil sure is in the live chat um, right now he mm -hmm. keeps teasing about this um about this guitar that he's been building and we've got some uh we've got some pictures and some um and some footage of it uh along with a lovely little email so i'll bring this over here mike for you to read and yes, I yes, will, yes. um yeah go on 
So Phil's been sending a couple of photos of this guitar, especially this beautiful top, and it's been really, really eye-catching. And uh, him and I have been chatting quite a bit. As you all know, I put it out there, if you are wanting to talk to somebody about anything, or you're feeling like you need a release, or you want somebody just to listen, we're here. And uh, that's not to say Phil did it, but one example is if somebody's going to send me a wee message, and I can get, if, I, if I've got time to read it, which I'll always make time to, yeah. We're here. Send us a message. Yep. Let's hear what you're saying. Whether it's an email or a private message, whatever suits yep. you. Um. Anyway, old mate Phil writes, Levi the Leviathan and Mike the Minotaur. <laughs> Feels like I get the fucking the short straw there. I don't. Know, I think Minotaur's are pretty cool. It's better than a Scottish sexy marmoset. Like Craig. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys. So the Monday Night Guitar Geek Club has come a long way, hasn't it? Who'd have thought a few people watching an Anglo-Scottish ranting session would have turned into such a cool, caring and kind little community. I genuinely love Monday nights now, make sure I'm free to join in with the banter, can't upset my hobby of war by missing it, and really appreciate what you guys do for us all. Phil, we're just doing the same as what you are doing, just having a good time and enjoying spending time with good mates, having a good time. Hey, as some of you know, I got desperately sick last year, and nearly this year for a total of seven months. This podcast, along with my son and family, kept me going. Christ, I was even watching this whilst kissing off nurses and getting my blood done in hospital. <laughs> Behave. Whilst I was sick, I decided I wasn't going to let any of that crap beat me, so I set about starting up my own company, North Pedalboards. Those designs are out with the manufacturers now and hopefully will be in shops soon. On top of that, I decided to get lessons in becoming a luthier. I've designed several guitars, which I hope to sell in the future. I've enclosed a few photos in this email for the guys to see if they're interested of the first prototype, which is almost complete. Anyway, the main reason I went to email is because I speak a little bit with both of you on Facebook and I've also learnt some new stuff from Levi's videos. Even listened to Party Cannon until I was doing 173 mile an hour in my Renault Twingo. <laughs> Don't laugh, that car rocks. <laughs> Twingo. Behave. Although, if you can go 173 in your Twingo, I want a shot. <laughs> I genuinely want to and I'm sure it's the best feeling for many a person in the community. Thank you for continuing with the Monday Night Guitar Geek Club as I'm sure it's something we all look forward to. Thank you also to all the guys who contribute, even if it's a tea ideas. If it's tea ideas and culinary pastry based dishes. Yeah. So, or delights, um... sorry. Thanks for the email, Phil. That's cracking. And I'm glad that you're on the mend, mate. I love how you were showing me pictures of you totally ripped at the gym and stuff and then you're like, oh, I'm nowhere near that now. And then I saw this photo and I'm like, fucking hell, he's still twice the size of me. Look at that <laughs> arm. Look at it. That fucking tree trunk. And more importantly, look at that guitar. Yeah. Phil, is this the first guitar you've built? Because if it is, Christ, mate, you've got a bit of a fucking thing going. Yeah, the thing I admire most about this, not just the guitar building side of things, like obviously he mentioned the pedal board thing to us too. Mm -hmm. um, having it off with manufacturers and... Um, hoping for it to be in, in shop soon. I have nothing but love, time and respect for people that go out and just fucking make their business work. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, because there's, it's intimidating to, because he, he's a guy, just a small guy. And I hope that other people can take some um, inspiration from this. Like go out and do your fucking thing. Uh, do the thing that you want to do. Life's too short to, to not do the thing that you love. Um, Every day I speak to Phil, I find out something mental about his past. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I went professional and I was playing tennis because of this. Like, you what? <laughs> yeah, I was bodybuilding because of that. Like, fuck, what? Like, what, how many things have happened to you that you've did? <laughs> so it's cool. I'm really glad to see it. Yeah. And uh, that guitar looks fucking beautiful. That maple top, man. Yeah. Oh. Though I'm going to... Um, oh, Lordy. I'm going to make a comment. <clears throat> what I'd like to see, what I'd like to see changed on this, Phil, because you're missing a key detail for me, my friend. The a seventh string? Me. I'm not really much of a seven string guy. I have a couple of seven strings. I'm still, I'm still definitely a six string. You never guy. gave me a piece of it, seven. What are you talking about? Just because they're suitable for what your, for your needs as a player. Um, you know what I'm gonna say, don't you? Get a fucking red stain on that, son. Get a ah, okay, okay. <laughs> I, in all fairness, I think that would look beautiful with a red stain, but yeah. it's gorgeous. Oh, it's, it yeah, and it's a lovely bit of wood. Lovely bit Absolutely. of wood. Absolutely. Which is why I say get a red stain on there because red stains make everything look beautiful. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm a big fan of the red. Phil, um, we're chuffed for you, man. It looks fucking great. I'm looking forward to getting a look at it. Once lockdown and all that's fucked off a bit. Um, I don't know how far south you are, Phil. Um, but I think we have or might be in position maybe soon to make plans to go and see some people. Um, <coughs> see a man about a dog, as we say in Scotland. Go yep. got a wee road trip for a couple of days or whatever. Yep. You could be on the list. Yeah, sure. I think we should maybe swing by and maybe see John Shooker again just for a wee quick hello and yeah. um, try and get some stuff for him because obviously his workshop's cracking. He did yep. the... Uh, ever tune on the the Skoda yeah 
your, your mayonnaise Skoda, the yeah. Octavius or whatever it's called. <laughs> um, and then John Brown and yeah. a couple other friends. Definitely, definitely plenty of people to, to see. Mm-hmm. We do have another bit of fan mail, but before doing it, I just wanted to uh, put a little bit of competition out there for Phil because uh, I, I sent this to Mike because I thought it was really cool. I'll bring up mm-hmm. pictures in a second, but Fender tweeted out about a custom shop Bog Oak Telecaster um, from Yuri Shishkov. It's um, carbon dating analysis confirmed the body top and fingerboard wood, which was sourced from Great Britain, is over 5,000 years old and was in the process of becoming coal. Uh, model also features a custom-made tailpiece and an RSDJ bridge. Um, this is really fucking cool. You know what it reminds me of, right? And that finish, the black machines. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. the wood that's totally. got to that point in totally. life where it loses a lot of the tone, but it becomes that beautiful, dark, deep, yeah, co- almost like coal, funnily enough, that yeah. charcoal style through the wood. Oh, yeah. look I'm at that thing, man. Not actually even sure what the um, what the the uh, black machines were were made out of, but I know exactly what A lot of them are black lumber and stuff. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, it's uh, really dark ebony. But I know that um, Doug for Black Machine... Sure is very selective on the woods he yeah. uses. So I would think some of that might come from it. Because as far as I know, in the source of this, it said that it was sourced for Great Britain. Yeah. It might even have been Doug that sold that top to them. Entirely possible, yeah. Um, though saying that, you would imagine that if uh, if Doug from Black Machine had been building guitars with wood that could be carbon dated to be 5,000 years old, uh, he probably would have... But, you know, that would be more well-known. People would be saying, fucking, this Black Machine sounds so good because they've been developing their tone for 5,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, I think this is a really, really nice looking, um, nice looking guitar. I'm sure we uh, on the on the podcast did we bring up the Telecaster that looked like a like an arch top, like a jazz jazz box arch top. I have a feeling we did, but I don't remember it. Do you want to bring it up? Well, if, if we did, uh, it wouldn't have been video. So I will I will just bring that up. Please. So after lots and lots and lots of searching, I finally bloody found this Telecaster. Um, it's a one of a kind. It was um, a. 2021 Chris Fleming master built prestige jazz telecaster um and to me this is this is what I'm I'm all about it's uh something you could sit in the living room and play some fucking western swing on yeah it's it's telly in the in the loosest sense of the word you know what i mean um <laughs> but a telly in the streets and a jazz is in the sheets <laughs> <laughs> is that flat round strings on it too yeah I love the um, just the basic wood saddle. Yeah, it's not even like intonated or anything. Yeah, my um. Although look at the the spacing of the strings on that photo, no ideal is it? <laughs> headstock, Headstock's I'm, beautiful. I well, you know, I was gonna say I'm not sure I feel like about that headstock. No, I love see that like the, the pinstripe binding. Yeah, that's really cool. Right down into the neck. Yeah, that is gorgeous, man. It looks it's kind of like race car vibes to me. Yeah. I think I'd rather see that, but on an actual Telecaster headstock. Though. No, I like that, man. I think there's something different. So, um, yeah. Well, like the open complete, back machine heads are beautiful too. Complete one of a kind. And you know that this will have been astonishing. There was a video. There absolutely was a video. I definitely saw a video of it. I believe you, man. For, I was just teasing you. Yeah. We looked for ages and, and just couldn't find it. So yep. um, I think we Googled every variant of Jazz Telecaster, Chris <laughs> Fleming, Master Belt, Prestige Fender, Custom Shop. Yeah. So uh, one of a kind, and it was sold to... Uh, Maplewood. So, who knows where that is now? But um, maybe that was a store somewhere. Yeah. What I can tell you is my uh, my hybrid guitar is looking looking a lot like that, a lot like that. So I wonder what one of those four you showed us it is. <laughs> it will look a lot like that. Let's put put it that way. Is that the kind of finish you're going to go for? Tobacco burst. Uh, flamed tobacco burst. Oh, you yeah. know what? I'm into that. Yeah, I am into that. Yeah, I just told the guys what I want is I want something that looks like an, an old Gibson ES-175, like a proper, what you think of as a jazz jazz box mm-hmm. or Gibson L5, mm-hmm. but in a shape that I would be more well-known for. <laughs> I'm excited so for you, man. That's even going as far as having that, that wee teardrop, um, you know, scratch plate type thing on it. See, pick guard. when I look at that guitar, I think like Art Deco, and I don't know why, I think it's maybe just the shapes, because it's quite geometric. Yeah. Because that, that might be a part of it, but I, I I think you are going to end up with a very, very beautiful instrument. Oh my God. I've found it. I found you it. You have! You found it! <laughs> it must be. Is it unlisted? It is. It's unlisted. That's how we couldn't find it. 
Hi, this is Chris Fleming, Senior Master Builder at the Fender Custom Shop, here to talk about my prestige guitar, the Jazz Telecaster. The inspiration for this guitar came from my love of jazz guitar, bebop style, mixed with my love of the Telecaster design. The guitar body is semi-hollow mahogany, this guy's top my hero. is spruce, and the top of the body is bound with tortoiseshell binding. The neck pocket on this guitar is angled to accommodate the wood bridge or two pneumatic, and the new Fender tailpiece was designed specifically for this instrument. The goal That's was cool. to create the feel of an arch top set up on a Telecaster. The neck is mahogany with a tilted snakehead headstock. I felt the snakehead shape would make a nice touch for this instrument. I wanted it to be simple and <laughs> traditional with a taste of the modern. Did we do this in the episode of World Drinking by any chance? Potentially. <laughs> the fingerboard, headstock veneer, pickguard, bridge, rear control plate, and the humbucker ring are all made from Brazilian rosewood. That was a classy instrument. This guitar has a volume control for the single Seymour Duncan antiquity pickup. The tuners are high-end Waverly open back tuners with tortoise shell buttons, and the strap buttons are also tortoise shell. The guitar is painted with nitrocellulose in a teardrop three-tone sunburst. The neck, back, and sides are transparent walnut. This is a true one of a kind and is from the last handful of instruments I've made prior to my retirement in January, 2021. There's no something else, man. The the worst part about it is um, I'm looking at this guitar story, and they've got prices for all of the other guitars, but there's no price for this one. <laughs> um, I definitely remember seeing a price for it, and maybe it's in the uh, in the comment section. Is it maybe because it's been bought? Potentially. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Top comment, Levi. This is absolutely stunning. I need it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh my that's a beautiful beautiful guitar I see Jake Reichbart has commented uh, looks great but no tone control that's a very very fair comment very fair comment for a jazz guitar with no tone control you would uh, well I mean uh, you would have to compensate heavily on the amp in order to, to make up for that because sure, any jazz guys an, uh, an, an EQ pedal and just roll off some of the high end well, jazz, jazz guitarists are well known for their love of an EQ pedal <laughs> oh, true. yeah so um, that's definitely uh Definitely a strange one, actually. I think uh, I would even go as far as saying that the, this guitar would probably have slightly more use to the jazz guitar player if that wasn't a volume knob, if that was literally just a tone knob. Mm -hmm. You plugged it in and it was always on, <laughs> like an acoustic guitar. Um, anyway, so I can't find the price on it, but you you get the idea. We uh, can't afford it anyway. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's just do this quick one from uh, Silvio Schuring. Is it Silvio Schuring? Schuring, I think it is. Uh, Schuring, yeah, sorry. We've got the first name right, though. Hi, Silvio. Thanks for writing <laughs> in. Uh, hi, guys. Long-time viewer. Just want to say hi for the most part. Hello. Thanks very much for writing in. Um, some observations on the future of musical instrument retailers in a recent episode I watched the other day. You sounded quite pessimistic concerning the future of this type of business, and I wonder whether that's really the only possible way into the future. These mom-and-pop type retailers had to look for multiple income streams for a long time. Offering some in-person teaching seems to be the most common. But I've always wondered why don't they offer some additional instrument-based services? If you offer, uh, sorry, if you order from the big on online retailers like Toman, unless you buy a floor model, they will just stick a shipping label in the box received from the manufacturer and forward that. If the small retailer does the same thing, except you probably get the floor model, who knows how many people have touched because of their typically much lower inventory. There's no reason to buy from the small store. But you can add some value via local services, like why not offer to string the guitar up with the customer's gauge set of choice, a basic setup, setting the action. You could even build that into one of the pricing models, buy the more expensive model and you'll get some services for free or similar. Also, I don't see why you couldn't find a business model that connected local, individually owned outlets via some central services. Amazon Retailers provides the basic business model, centralised warehouse and logistics services to offer a wide range of products. No reason that could not work with a service provider other than Amazon. And it could include specialised options to get some higher-end models to local stores for customer hands-on experience. Possibly additional services like Plek the Guitar or similar services that require higher investment in machines or skilled labour than a single local store could employ. I think that, yeah, the whole online thing game is, eh, sorry, is a game-changer. But I think there are enough opportunities for local business that other than just or sorry, to other than just surrender to Amazon. I feel people are mostly trying to preserve the existing business model. Best regards, Silvio Schurig. I think he's presented a lot of, you know, ideal, like, you know, utopian ideals there. Mm -hmm. But the reality of the situation is the mum and pop shops are, they already have to sell the product at a higher price point than the big box retailer can. 
because they are buying less, so they aren't getting as good deals. Sometimes they don't even get access to the stock, yeah. was my experience. I, I like where you're going with it, Silvio, and I think a lot of the mom and pop stores, the independents, um, could potentially really solidify their position in the market if a buying consortium was set up or them and other shops decided to to band up and start their own distribution network yeah um, or even just a, like a distribution company so they're buying in stock but they're buying it for 10 stores instead of one mm. all individuals are getting their order in but they still meet the minimum order pricing and they get yep. better prices and they get better stock blah 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 but that's that uh, that's where the um the gatekeeping comes in a lot of brands these days, a lot of manufacturers and distributors will not give you access to half the stuff that you would actually want without taking on X amount in stock value for all the other stuff, um, especially like Gibson and Fender, yeah. especially. Um, and a lot of brands now are also moving away from genuine uh, bulk pricing. Certainly, I know a few guitar brands that at one point would offer you great discounts if you took hundreds, thousands of strings, uh, a range across the, the, the different gauges and stuff, that no longer do that. They basically just say, this is the price per set of strings, this is what the street retail is, Yeah. and if you're taking millions, we can maybe take a bit off, but otherwise we're devaluing the product and we're not doing it. Yeah. Um. Which I understand, I totally understand. Everybody's yeah. trying to make money at the end of the day, um, and... Distributors especially are the middleman, so they are always going to try and take a cut because they are yeah. they're, they're not they're not providing and they're not yeah. also selling to the end consumer. But um, yeah. they, it's it's really difficult. I think that your ideas, as Levi said, is, is idealistic, but in a good way. Like you're trying to find a solution to a problem that's there, and these are good solutions, but they're solutions that don't necessarily add value to the wee stores yeah. because they're going to have to go out their way and do. They're already paying more for the stock, as you yeah. say. Then they're going to have to invest in something else. And then they're going to have to add extras onto that. Yeah. And there's more chance that somebody's going to come in and haggle with them. Yeah. Um, and then the also thing, or the other thing you, you also need to consider, especially if they're buying their stock at a higher price and trying to be competitive on the market with online pricing, they might only have a profit margin of 10%. Yeah. You still need to offer aftercare to that customer. Yeah. And I'm not saying that's something that you should grudge in any way, and it should definitely be part of your business model, 100%. But you need to consider that that's going to then eat into your profits. If somebody comes back and says, I'm not happy with this, I'm not happy with that, this is something I want done and that and whatever else. Um, and you either do your best for them, which I, I don't know a single independent store that wouldn't, or you then have to think about, is this person going to ever buy with me again? Yeah. It's really, really hard. Really, yeah, really a, hard it's to It's a balance. balancing act. Um, mm -hmm. Because what he's talking about is offering more options to the customer. Mm -hmm. And even if that's, you know, additional, a set of strings to put on the guitar. Mm -hmm. I think guitar shops, it's easy to persuade them when you buy a new guitar to throw in a set of strings. Mm -hmm. um, but persuading them to also put those strings on the guitar for you, if they were having to do that for every guitar, well, that's staff time, you know, that's and that's a cost to the business. Not just that. As soon as you put the strings on that guitar and it's not playing right or you get a choked fret, the, the yeah. expectation is you're going to do the setup. Exactly, which would mean that every single store that would want to do a model like this would need to make sure they have someone in the store that is not necessarily world class, but let's say Capable. incredibly proficient at guitar setup, and that, I, in my experience, just isn't isn't the case. I, I've never experienced that with a with a store where I could um, consistently just rely on oh. I'll just, you know, if I've got a problem with my guitar, I will just go to my local guitar store and I'm sure there's, there'll be someone in that shop that will know exactly how to how to fix this problem. They'll know somebody, but they won't be employed by the store. That will just be a, a, a mutual network of contacts that they mm -hmm. have type thing. Mm -hmm. um, so Even Magnum Sound looks like that. If you remember yeah. taking your Telecaster in, Bill could do the wiring for you, no yeah. problem, whatever else, change the plate about. But things like refrets and stuff, yeah, we yeah. would always put out to somebody else who's more experienced and more capable. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you'll just what you're doing is you are introducing additional levels of cost which would either have to be eaten up by the by the mum and pop retailer or then passed on to the consumer which in turn makes them less likely to purchase mm -hmm. so I, I i do like the ideas but um yeah you are trying to compete it's like trying to compete with spotify you know you're uh you've been undercut so significantly that it's really hard to compete on the same playing field you need to um offer something completely different i think than I kind of... That's why we were pessimistic. <laughs> I kind of disagree with what you're saying, okay. though. I think um, 
if enough of the mum and pop stores or even people who were just interested in sorting something out developed a buyer's consortium and this is something Fraser and I had discussed back at Magnum Sound mm -hmm. days because there used to be a consortium called Euro Music right. and they would basically buy stuff from manufacturers cheap as fuck brand it themselves and then they would get all the stores that were part of the consortium would get that stock cheap as fuck as well. Yep. So they were building um, the value of the brand already. They were building brand loyalty and they were also building themselves like a kind of nest egg of yep. direct supply. They're in control of what it costs. They're in control of what they can price it at. They're in control of how much they can get. They know where it's coming from, the quality, etc. which was really, really good. Um, I think something like that would need to happen again before the market would be more comfortable for mom and pop stores that's not to say that all independents struggle there's plenty of guitar shops that do great because they do their own stuff yep. like peach guitars that's not a well it is a big brand but it's obviously it's, it's alan peach and is it john peach it's john priest john priest sorry yeah. yeah but that's one store yeah but that is a lot of high-end incredible stuff with a lot of really good customers well I'm, I'm glad you mentioned peach there because i think that if we look at the uk scene there are a few your, your big boy would be Guitar Guitar, I imagine. Yes, they're the biggest Potentially stocks. Andertons. I think Guitar Guitar are actually the biggest stockholder of guitars and musical instruments in Europe. Yeah, that but I, that would make sense to me. Followed, surely, in the UK by Andertons? Uh, I would think so. Yeah, and then Maybe I Maybe was... GAC? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't... You, you're you probably right on that one. I think Guitar and Keyboard and Andertons are probably about the same size. Yeah. Um, I don't think of GAC as being that, but of course that? you are totally right, they are. Gear for Music's probably bigger than both of them. And I don't mean that as in they've got a better stock profile, I mean as in they've probably got so much more of their own stuff, yeah. they hold more stock yeah. I, in I, total. I'm thinking from a perspective of the stores that I'm going to see based on my interests like okay, to yep. carry the types of gear that i'm that i'm into guitar guitar is going to be number one then because yeah. they do everything yeah if for me it'd be guitar guitar and then i would put peach up and there's another great shop called um what they call world music world guitar world guitars um mm -hmm. world guitars they're out on the uh on the west coast which feels strange for the uk because it's so th narrow it's really just one one strip which is both yeah. yourself. but anyway the um, west and east coast can be traveled to in about an hour well are you familiar with world guitars no what about you bring up world guitars for yes you? please do yeah there's a there's a lot of good independent retailers in scott and the uk um who is it that's in ireland it's all the rare guitars a really 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 good stock profile there's a video with joe bonamassa in there buying something Fuck me! It's not in but Ireland, <laughs> Dublin, or I Bel wouldn't even Belfast. believe Ireland existed if it wasn't for Connor watching the show. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the flat Earth Island, isn't it? Um, so <laughs> it's just a theory, a conspiracy yeah, theory. Yeah. <laughs> this is well, guitars. Like, they have a, they have a great selection of stock. Some some wonderful stock. Um, and the thing I really like these these guys actually do offer, or they certainly did offer a really unique service, which is. Uh, you would buy your guitars from them, um, and they ha they used to have see these incredible photos they take. Oh, I of of the instruments. Um, you could have your guitar. They would provide like a high quality photo book that came with the guitar, like a professionally printed photo book of your wow. instrument, which was used to be a really really nice touch. Um, th these guys stock like incredible. Oh, that's like just high end specialist. If you want to buy something really incredible that you know is going to be looked after by us and treated yeah. right, then that's what you're going to get. But the, I guess the point that I'm going for oh. with with what the uh, well guitars are doing, um, and how a mum and pop shop is going to not necessarily struggle, but the thing they have to fight against is, like I said, in my mind, you've got guitar, guitar, and the big boys, mm -hmm. then Anderton's probably the next guys then you've got peach guitars who at one point will have been on par in terms of size with world guitars but they've kind of fought their way up mm -hmm. now i think that to do what you're talking about having everybody working together there has to be this idea of everybody coming up together whereas actually in reality businesses are owned by individuals and those individuals want to make sure that they're above their competition type mm -hmm. thing well see this isn't so much a we're all in tow and we're all going to begin up at together at the same level it's actually more so a we all want to sell instruments. Yep. We all are in the same market, struggling against the same thing, which is that bigger brands like Guitar Guitar, etc. 
can price out the market without trying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But they don't have the same services as sure. they might have fast shipping, but they're not an actual physical store well, that you can that. walk into. Still waiting on my Brent Mason from those guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Uh, yeah. Fender besides. Yeah. Um, I'd be interested actually to look into the history of Guitar Guitar because I don't really know where they where they came from. They came from Sound Control. Really? When Sound Control liquidated, the two owners became Kenny's Music and Guitar Guitar. Okay. They split the stock between them. Right, and okay. at one point, Guitar Guitar had the biggest stock in the UK at least. Okay. And that was just after Kenny's Music thing had, uh, sorry, Sound Control right, okay. melted down. But that's my understanding. It was the two guys that run Sound Control okay. when Sound Control... I also feel bad that when we were talking about stores, I didn't mention Dawson's. Dawson's, Dawson's. is pretty, pretty big in the UK. Yes. Um, but yeah, my, I think my point is like, you see it a lot in the, in the instrument industry, to the manufacturing, manufacturing of instrument industry. Uh, brands, you can either see people that do make the same things as you as uh, your peers and people that you work with and you wish for their success and you, and you would help them in their success. Mm -hmm. Or you can see them as competition. You want to suppress their success. And... You know, I think your level of success is just how you deal with other other people. It would be very easy for a guitar uh, manufacturer, sorry, a, a guitar retailer, to take issue and, and not want to do anything that might help your competition. Mm -hmm. um, you know, through fear of it limiting your own successes. And I get you. Yeah. Um, maybe not so much everybody buys it or peers up together. Not it's all a common cause because I know what you're saying. There's still yeah. going to be competition in that yeah. sales market. Um, but certainly, I think if, if there was some sort of buyer's conglomerate or consortium in the UK that was either getting their own stock and branding it and making it more equipped, or sorry, more accessible for these brands, or offering them an incentive to buy in to make themselves better profits, then I think a lot of music stores, independents at least, would uh, would be in a better position. Sure. But that's probably idyllic thinking. And to everybody that kind of comments and criticizes when we go off on little political rants and talk straight politics on the show, um, the thing you I think is worth considering is that almost everything is political in nature, right? And yes. what we're talking about there is is it's pol politics, it's individual politics, it's it's uh dealing with, with other individuals and how you strike deals with people, but on the grand mm -hmm. scheme of things, is that not what politics is? If it's not politics, it's economics and yet again hand in hand. Hand in hand, yeah. So all I wanted to say there is it's, it sounds like you're saying seize the means of production. Let's move on. Me? <laughs> Me? I would never say that. Yeah. So this uh, this next story, Paul Gilbert says he ridiculed fat Elvis Malmsteen at a magazine photo shoot and talks how he reacted. This is really fucking, <laughs> really funny. Really funny. Because I can't imagine Paul Gilbert admitting to this, telling a story like this. Um, I'm sure many people have seen this old young guitar issue, right? With uh, Paul Gilbert on the on the cover in the, in the classic Elvis uh, attire with Malmsteen, right? Um, Mike, Mike, read this. I haven't actually seen this read article this. before. So, um, when Paul Gilbert was asked, "Do you remember the first time you met Ingvi?" Paul replied, "The first time I met him. This is funny and embarrassing at the same time. I met him at a photo session where I was mocking him. It was during his big Elvis period where he'd gone from skinny Ingvi to big Ingvi, and I rented an Elvis costume. This was in Japan, and I rented a seventies Elvis costume and did the photo session dressed as skinny Elvis, and I was kind of, as they say in England, taking the piss out of him. Fortunately, he didn't know I was doing that, but later on, I was at one of the Marshall dinners, and his tour manager was there. It was his wife's sister or something. We were introduced, and they said, oh, this is Paul Gilbert, blah, blah, blah. And then she just looks at me and goes, wait a minute, you're the one who wore the Elvis costume, and she was pissed. And rightly so, that wasn't the nicest thing to do, what I had done, but I couldn't resist. I'm not much of a prankster, but every once in a while you just have to do it, and she knew what I was up to. I thought if I can get to be on the cover of a magazine with Ingvi, I've got to do it. I had to talk my way out of it, and fortunately I think she got a sense I'm a fairly harmless guy, so they let me off the hook. And I'm sure whatever she's had to put up with with Ingvi, I'm sure my little prank was nothing compared to what he can muster. <laughs> it's just knowing Paul Gilbert's nature to be like... Because that could be taken as being really snide. Sure. For those that don't know the word snide, it's like um, underhandedly cheeky. Like uh, not quite tongue-in-cheek. It's not a serious point that you're making a laugh with. It's more like you're having a laugh, but at their expense. Yeah, like a, there's like an ill will element to it. Yes, yeah. yes. It's like a very underhanded, very yeah. um, so, sneaky. Though, of course, um, Paul Gilbert <laughs> talking about being quite a prankster. I'm sure... Uh, 
I'm sure everybody remembers the Paul Gilbert and G3 when he was on G3 with uh, with Petrucci. I've never watched any of the G3s. Okay, so it's just, it's just something I was not into. No, being not. totally honest, I, I, don't get me wrong. I'm sure there's some great footage from them, but if I was wanting to go and see somebody playing, I think it would have to be like I want to see that artist. It's not that I want to go and see this person and that person and somebody else, and then they'll all play that set and then they'll jam at the end. So Paul Gilbert. Um, Talking about being a prankster, mm -hmm. um, he put, when they were on the G three tour together, uh, Paul Gilbert, John Petrucci, and um, Satriani, um, for a short period, uh, Paul played a wee prank on Petrucci. Let's see it. <laughs> Who's he quoting Stacey Lee dancing with? That's the rest of his band. That's amazing. For <laughs> Glasgow Kiss. Yeah. See the boy that's playing bass for him just now? Uh, yeah, it's Dave Leroux. I think it's Dave Leroux. I, uh, he played with Satriani when I went to see him the second time and he was fucking tremendous. Just as good as Stu Hart. Oh, that, the big dude that was at the front there, I'm sure he's a bass player. Yeah, yeah. And he played that, um, that Thunderbird. Look at his knees. No, yeah. it was an Iceman, an yeah. Iceman, and it was super low. Yeah, it's a uh, uh, great player. M Mike, Mike. Good name. Or it's Mike. Didn't see anybody in the eyes, obviously a good cunt. Mike, Mike, I can see his face. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, that's uh, that's annoying. So, Paul Gilbert, um, evidently as the years go by, we learned him to be a little bit more of a we the prankster, um, and I like that. It's so. harmless pranks, though, then. That's the thing, isn't it? Yeah, I think in, in that, like running on stage when, when someone you're on tour with is doing a song that's got like a cheesy scottish vibe and you're in kilts having a wee dance that's that's quite funny um whereas i can totally see the the malmsteen thing like being taken the being taken the wrong way <laughs> mm -hmm. um but yeah still still very funny still very very funny shall we talk about something else that's equally funny really quick on oh. this one because i don't really want to give him much more credit but um we'll, we'll do the we'll do the same joke um what have what's levi clay and lucas man got in common I don't know which Levi Clay and Lucas Mann got in common. Neither of us have got record deals or vocalists. <laughs> 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 so this, did you read the post? I did read the post. It is, yeah, it's, it's genuinely like one of those terrible copy pastas. And yeah. if, if you're on any of those shitty Facebook pages like gent shit posting or anything, everybody has been posting this. Yeah. Everybody. And uh, do you know Abiotic? Shout out to Abiotic. Great guys. Um, John, as soon as they saw this, decided to, to rewrite it, right, and repost it on his band's page, but rather than it being a strictly instrumental direction, it's strictly a cappella. It's <laughs> fucking hilarious, man. So, so good. Um, so the statement is, Rings of Saturn is transitioning towards a strictly instrumental direction, which will open up many new doors in terms of musical, creavi uh, musical creativity for the band's future. We are looking forward to exploring new territories of writing and expanding the band's overall sound in this way, along with the recent instrumental album release versions of our past discography. By the way, for anybody that has, is like, oh, I've not heard that, they've somehow re-recorded them and made them sound even less human and worse. Don't ask me. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm probably biased in saying that, to be fair. Uh, along with the recent instrumental album, blah, 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 every album since Dinger, or dingy or whatever the fuck it's called it has transitionally included an, or traditionally included an instrumental track so many fans will appreciate what's coming next with a sense of familiarity we would love to have Ian Bearer on any of the tours we currently have booked but that decision remains ultimately up to him and moving forward that also means that live shows will then be done completely as an instrumental band we would like to thank Ian Bearer for his years of hard work and commitment as the voice of the band during its most recent 10 years on tour and in the studio it's been an honour to create and perform music alongside such a great vocalist we absolutely wish him the best in any endeavour he decides to pursue, and we hope that fans show him the same love and support as well. That sounds to me like Ian got fed up of all the shit. Something happened between him and Lucas after they lost a record deal, and Lucas has went, mm, more mouths to feed equals less money for me. Well, yeah, yeah. To, to me, all I saw when I saw this was the uncertainty of not having a record label means your financial future as a band is is a little bit less stable and therefore it would be really useful to us if we could limit how much money's having to 
be be shared around or sorry limit how many people that money is being shared between so um yeah it's that, just, to that me could it's, be us being total shitty cynics i don't know well um yeah which is why i'm saying to me like i definitely wouldn't say that is how it is but like mm -hmm. it's the first thing that pops into into my mind because you you're a band that's had a singer for 10 years and now you're just gonna you are fundamentally changing what the band is at this stage like that's just sounds like you've got a different why not a different band why not just have rings of Saturn? And then fucking rings of Uranus. He did have a side project with Charles Caswell called Dads. Right. Um, Lucas Mann did at least. I don't feel bad for Lucas at all, but I certainly feel bad for the rest of the band. Um, yeah. I know it's just signed off as uh, Lucas and Joel Omens, but my friend Mike Caputo plays drums for them. Yeah. Pretty much any time uh, Marco's not doing so, so he's yeah. like the live drummer for the most part. Um. It's just a bit fucking disappointing for him, man. He spent the last year and a bit, obviously, not being able to gig or anything. And what's he got to look forward to now that lockdown and stuff starting to fuck off a bit? All this controversy and shite? Yeah. Just no fair, man. And Mike's a great guy and a fucking fantastic drummer. So yeah. I hope it works out for him at least. Sure. Um, for his sake, at least. I don't mean that as in, like, good for him and then everybody else gets fucked. <laughs> Have you heard that Dave Ellison's a bit of a wanker? I have heard that, aye. Aye. Uh, he likes to come on a bit strong. This is, I have to say, guys, not something I want to talk about. <laughs> Bust in peace. Yeah. <laughs> Counting down to ejaculation. <laughs> um, Trade of consequences. It's something I, I don't want to really talk about. Because... For closure of a wet dream. <laughs> Banger 18. <laughs> right, I'm just going to sit here for a minute. Let it get them all out. Let it <laughs> I'm happy. You Have you seen? There is one really, really funny fucking meme, and it's him with the Jackson headstock, and somebody's just covered it on with off. Jacks off. Yeah. <laughs> or him photoshopped on it, covered in Metallica load. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're having a good good laugh at his expense because it I'm not trying to ever laugh at no, his sure, expense. He, sure. He's taking it as it is, which is good, and it's not the situation that it's been made out to be. Um, and he, he's taken it in the only way that you possibly could in a scenario like this because he uh, immediately acknowledges that he cannot delete this from the internet though mm -hmm. I'm sure he would like to mm -hmm. um, but and you know what if, it, if he could press a button if I could press a button that would delete it from the internet delete it from the consciousness I'd absolutely go for that so would I, I don't is, want to see him wanking yeah, this and is, I don't um, want to see him going through that because he's never really been a bad guy and it, I, I get what you're getting at I think the controversy about this is that the story has not been told in an honest way hmm at all. So really? let's tell people about that story. Yes. So, since we've not actually said what the scenario was, yeah. David Ellison has been at the centre of quite a controversy recently um, after videos of him uh, enjoying himself have uh, surfaced online that were sent to someone privately. Enjoying himself? So he was playing playing bass along to some Megadeth stuff? Um, you could definitely say he was strumming, but oh, he wasn't okay. playing bass. Right, I see. Um, he was, he was, he was uh, def definitely getting his hand in the neck. <laughs> uh, yes. So, Dave had some uh, he had a relationship with a fully uh, per willing participant. It's probably the way I would put it. So that they're completely um, consensual, and I believe. She was of age. She certainly said she was of age. Right. So, but that's the the problem. When she came out, she said, "I was absolutely of age. This was absolutely consenting." But the story didn't break like that. The story no, broke with he had been grooming an underage fan. Yes. And now, so basically, the way it happened to to give it like a more of a uh, actual timelined way, it broke on social media on an anonymous Twitter account saying. David Ellison has been grooming my friend. Mm. I've come into contact with this, and he's, I don't know if he's been doing it with other people and blah, 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 and sending this content and whatever else um, to an underager and blah, 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 and then these videos were released. Now, outside of anything else, that is revenge porn. Mm. It is highly illegal yeah. and would get you, I'd imagine it's a felony in the, a felony in the States. That's yeah. fucking jail time because it's just not on. Yeah. Anyway, that happened. And then David and Megadeth kind of responded saying, we've heard the allegations, that's not what's going on, but we're... We're monitoring. Yeah, we're going to do our best to deal with our situation. And then David uh, reposted something from another Twitter account or potentially an Instagram. Instagram, yeah. Instagram, sorry. Which was, 
I mean, unverified, but I would believe it because it wasn't David that posted; it was somebody else potentially. Um, that's the other person involved. Saying, if if it wasn't her, it would have came out. By yeah, now that I it wasn't think so. Her. I think it would have been a much bigger shit show if that yeah. was the case. Anyway, this person has come out and said, "Actually, I just want to make sure that this is very clear. This is a friend of mine's who's got a hold of these videos and released them without my consent. This was content that was sent to me of age when I fully consented and I asked for it from David." Because we were both, we had some sort of romantic fling. None of this was done out of uh, grooming or weirdness. Mm. And I would really like if you would all just stop at the moment and just yeah. think on the situation. This was two private individuals yeah. doing something they were both comfortable with. And someone else has got involved and changed the the the, uh, the optic you're yeah. looking at it through. And David reposted that on his Twitter yeah. and Instagram, I believe, and then Megadeth have kind of just kept an eye since then. Yeah, and I agree with you; it's not funny. I, I'm laughing at the puns because I'm sure I, I'm trying to make light of a serious situation, but sure, not. Sure. I don't want to laugh at David. I want to laugh at the scenario. Yeah, but it's it's also not funny because, as you say, like that, that's a big effect on his life, his professional life, how he's seen in the public because he's a public figure, whether you want to admit it absolutely. or not. Absolutely, no, absolutely. And and, uh, and how well a story like this, like inevitably for for a huge portion of his fan base, their fan base, there is um, an element of this that can never be forgiven. You know what I mean? Like yes. people aren't willing to forgive him for en engaging in consenting sexual acts with another consenting adult. You're right. And I've seen it online a couple of times. It's been spun every time somebody's put the right context in place. Yeah. So it's like, ah, oh, he's a sexual predator. It's like, well, no, they were of age and they asked. Yeah, but it's creepy that he waited till they were of age because it was obviously happened beforehand. Well, that's never been said yeah, or quantified. Yeah, can't say obviously and uh... exactly. And then like, um, ah, but there's such an age difference. It's like again, doesn't matter. They were both willing participants. Yeah, yeah. Anyone that goes down that route, um, like we we half had a conversation about this, and I'm just of the opinion that it's like, I I totally see it. Like I'm 32 years old, and when me and Haley broke up. Uh, when I went on Tinder looking for people, you can absolutely looking for people people to meet. You can absolutely bet that I put the minimum age of people that I was willing to talk to as thirty, right? Not because I felt like a but the idea of having a a conversation, a um, a date with an eighteen year old is just I don't feel it's wrong, but it's it's not for you. It's just totally not for me. I don't yeah. even slightly see the appeal of that. Having said that, if you are uh, older, uh, a fifty year old man, how old's Dave? Like fifty seven. Fifty-seven, and you're into eighteen or nineteen-year-olds. I mean, you're a fucking rock star. Um, so I'm sure there are plenty of uh, eighteen, nineteen-year-olds that are that are into you. The the pro while I can totally look at that and go, ugh, that feels a bit repulsive to me. The idea of doing that feels a bit rep repulsive to me. I have to acknowledge that me saying that is no different than somebody that doesn't that thinks that um, homosexuality is wrong for no reason other than than. When they think of that, they go, ugh, that mm -hmm. doesn't, you know what I mean? Like, it's, yeah. it's just because otherwise we're having to say that 18 year olds, 19 year olds who are of the legal age of consent and are considered adults, mm -hmm. they're well, they're not, adults. yeah, they're not really adults, you know, all right, they've just joined the club, but they're still not quite allowed to make decisions for themselves. And I just can't do that. I have to give individuals well, the their own yeah. agency. Because yeah. they can't even have a paint until they're 21. Yeah. Yeah. So I get what you're saying. Aye, aye. right. And that's, well, that... there's also the additional complexity of the flexible age of consent depending on where you live. Like over here, she could have been 16 and it would have been legal. In France, she could have been 14 and it would have been legal. But that's, I think that the argument isn't so much that it's illegal. I know that was one of the things that was said by the person who leaked the videos. Yes. But I wouldn't even go as far as to say it's amoral. I don't think that age gap would be something that I would like in a relationship. Other people are completely different. And this is also not a relationship. This was a sexual fling is probably mm. the best way to put it. We don't know if that lassie sent him anything back yeah. or otherwise. She yeah. might have just sent him a video saying, go and wank for me and he's done it. Yeah. Right? It doesn't make him a paedophile. No. He's not viewing any content that is of fair. questionable age. Ah, totally fair. He's not done it uh, uh, as far as we know. It seems to be that he's just yeah. been asked and then did it. I don't really consider that. Maybe like, maybe sexual kinks are such a weird thing mm -hmm. and you should never kink shame someone like for all we know david has a thing for degrading himself by just sending people videos of him wanking at their request mm -hmm. knowing that they are then going to share those videos with their friends like, potentially potentially it's entirely possible and if that's what he's into i've told you the story about all, all for you dave it's not for me but being a uh, propositioned by someone with a yeah. kink yeah, yeah. Haven't i told it on yeah. here yeah but uh Nancy and I being offered £250 each to spit in a guy's face. Yeah. That was interesting. Yeah. 
Yes, but I wouldn't think that that's not me shaming them. That's just me saying that's like... I don't get it myself, you know? No, of course when not. I send, and I don't judge him on when that. When I send videos of, of me, when I send you videos of me wanking, mm -hmm. you know, I, I expect them not to be shared, so... Aye, but that's because you get them back. <laughs> it's, it's mutual. Mm -hmm. uh, we're just fueling this uh, this uh, fan fiction now, aren't we? Aye, aye. That's <laughs> it. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a shame that we have to talk about it. The other thing to consider, of course, is that he's married. Um, and people are going to take huge issue with that. Yes. But again, we don't know the relationship that he has with his wife. Um, yes. Again, maybe she's off doing the same. Maybe this is the agreement that they have in place. Maybe this is absolutely fine between the two of them. Maybe it's none of your fucking business. Exactly. Which is why when I have to point out that we... I said I didn't want to talk about this. And it wasn't because it's not worth talking about. I don't want to talk about Dave. When we talk about things like this, it's about people. It's about the community as a whole and how we, sh we should and could be better in scenarios like this. Absolutely. And ultimately, anybody should be able to look at this and go, huh. Have I ever wanked on video for someone? And if, if the answer to that is yes, then you immediately need to, need to shut up. And I think that's going to shut up probably 85% of people on this story. Uh, it's, it's good that you say people because that's not just men. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, yeah, definitely definitely a weird one. And I, I just feel want sorry people... for David. Absolutely. Because absolutely, this, there's nothing more embarrassing, is there? Than, no. Than sh having something that you thought was private and, and consensual shared. There's nothing yes. embarrassing about what he did. But there's absolutely something embarrassing about th the audience that that thing was for then being blown up to the entire world. That's it. That's it. Especially so, with him being a public figure. Yeah. Um, I, I, I know what you're saying. And yeah. I think um, here's the lesson I would like to take away for this, right? And I, I'm not even being daft. I'm not being flippant. Whatever you choose to do on video for a consensual partner... You should be very well aware that the minute your camera opens, the chances are that's going to be on the internet forever. Yeah. Whether that is in private or in the public eye. Yep. And it is a genuine thing you need to concern yourself with. Even if you're just talking about putting a post on Facebook, you need to think, do I want that being on the internet forever? Yeah. Is that going to have an impact on me? Who's going to be able to view that? Who's potentially going to view that? Who's Who would use this in the wrong way? I would like to think, right, that... Uh... When Megadeth come to Glasgow next, mm -hmm. that I might be able to wrangle us some some uh, some meet and greet backstagey type things via Kiko. I would like to think that. I'm know. I'm pretty sure Kiko will be like, come on then, let's go. Exactly uh -huh. right. And in a scenario like that, uh -huh. I would still happily go up to Dave and shake him by his wanking hand. Aye. Because you know what? When you meet somebody and you shake their hand, they've probably had their dick in that hand. And if if they're not a guy, they've probably had a dick in that hand. Mm -hmm. Dave did nothing wrong. It's just a penis. Get a grip. I was going to say we've all got one, but <laughs> no, get a grip's a better way to end it. Good, good point. Yeah, get, lovely. Get, get a grip. Um, <laughs> just before we move on, actually, that's sure. an absolute belter of a song. Uh, you know, Semi Sonic that did Secret Smile. I was really Smile. worried you were going to say this one. <laughs> no, no, I mean, we can talk about this as well, but you know, yeah. Semi Sonic that did Secret Smile. Yes, they wrote quite a lot of good songs. Um, and Closing Time was sure. the other one that cool. was a big single, but they've wrote loads of songs for other bands and stuff as well. Right. But they've got quite a rocky song, it's almost like Feeder or something. It's called Get a Grip, right. Have a, have a listen to the lyrics to that and think what it's about. <laughs> uh, who's this? Get a grip on yourself, you know you should. I've got a grip on myself and it feels good. <laughs> it's fucking tremendous. It's a yeah. great song, it's dead catchy. I'm getting bored with that. Um, anyway, speaking of not catchy. Yeah, this is a, a really weird one. K.K. Downing has released uh, a, his single, um, Hellfire Thunderbolt, via his new band called as embarrassing as it gets, KK's Priest. Didn't this man leave Judas Priest because he'd had enough of, like, doing the... doing the priest thing? I think he left a faster than a bullet. <laughs> He's now done his best to start up a new legacy for himself, but has relied on the word priest in order to do so. Mm -hmm. And for anyone that's listened to this song, Hellfire Thunderbolt... Um, it just sounds like Judas Priest. Like, of course, it just sounds like Judas Priest. I can't imagine KK has had all that much musical influence outside of the massive musical influence that he has created for the world. You don't expect him to leave Judas Priest and then come out with a Gent record. Like, obviously, we expect it to sound like a certain thing, but this really just it sounds like a fucking Priest tune. Um, my comment has to be, Jesus Christ, Hellfire Thunderbolt. It is the most dire uh, lyrical offering. Generic... And these aren't things that I ever really considered or thought about until I constantly talk about songwriting with Melissa. Mm -hmm. And now it's just like, 
You know why I think it feels that way, though? Go on. Because Judas Priest got away with that, because that was part of their shtick. Sure. And I think a big part of that genuinely is that Rob Halford is completely unapologetic about being himself, and there is nothing more metal than a guy who does not give a fuck being something that other people might look down on and still just doing his own shit. Sure. Like, anybody that, and this, again, not a criticism in any way, shape or form or any sort of horrible comment, but anybody that didn't see that Rob Halford was gay in the 80s and, like, just wasn't paying attention. And that's fine. I, I mean, that's a good thing. You shouldn't need to see what this guy's sexuality is to be, to not think, or to think anything different about the band because, sure. realistically, Metalheads are all these big brr, fucking black leather and spikes and being hard. <laughs> and it was Rob Halford that done quite a lot of that stuff to start with. Uh, Rob Halford was harder than all of them. <laughs> actual. Like, actually, he's, he's like a trailblazer yeah. for people that don't realise or, or didn't realise his sexuality and might have had a problem with yeah. it if they did. I, I'd like to think they wouldn't. I'd, li I'd like to think of the metal community. Oh, we know community. they would have at the time. <laughs> I was going to say, I like to think of the metal community as fairly accepting, but that's not always true. Yeah. Um, but I fucking love Rob Halford, man. He's just a dad. Yeah, no, absolutely. He is the dad. I take it you've seen the Raised by Owls inspired yes. Jim will paint it. Yeah. <laughs> Rob Halford, Rob's Halfords. Yeah. It's fucking <laughs> tremendous, man. Tremendous. Um, so, yeah, I just think that, like, it's it's a little bit more acceptable with Vintage Priest, right? Because it's it's the original it's the originators of that sort of thing right? it's fucking tremendous it's just it's just what you want for judas priest i've seen judas priest live right and despite it being probably the most boring set in the world in terms of just in terms of energy sure. right they were still great they were tight as fuck yeah but <laughs> it was ridiculous man you know how rob used to come out on stage with the motorbike and yeah, all that yeah. it was on this fucking rotating stand or, or like a lift or whatever in the middle of the stage with this big fucking hell ripper motorbike and then he just couldn't push it. He was <laughs> fucked. And then, who's the drummer again? Played in uh, Travis Scott. Travis Scott, exactly. Yeah. Played in Racer That's X. Right. He started doing the intro to Painkiller. Yeah. And obviously, that being a big famous song and it being a kind of drum intro, he was doing that and then stopping and getting the crowd to shout or whatever. But yeah. he could not have looked less fucked if he tried. <laughs> just wasn't he interested. So he would be like, and then just stop. And then just be like, chewing his tune. I'm like, one, two, three. Oh, you've clapped. Well done. No way. And it was just like so lackluster compared to what it could have been. Yeah. Um. I saw them as well, and I can. I uh, probably same same thing. Megadeth opening for them. Eh, no, I saw them at a festival. Okay. Okay. I saw them at. It must have been download. Yeah. I also saw, and this is probably going to get me shot off the hardcore fans. I saw a Motorhead, mm -hmm. Bone, very loud. Yeah. Tight Bone. Yeah, so it's, it's understandable. Like it's to totally understandable. So it's, it's um, I think you're gonna get. To me, it'd be like seeing a band like I don't know the Ramones or the Sex Pistols. Um, oh, I should just throw this in. I've left a comment on the last video, but like we talked a lot about punk on the last episode, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people didn't like what I said about punk, and I never actually thought that the most controversial political statements on this show would come from from me. And I should clarify. I should be to be fair to you guys. You're absolutely right. When I talk about what punk is. I was raised by punks in the UK. Yes. Um, so my uh, my experience of punk is a certain thing. I'm obviously ve very well aware that punk was also adopted by skinheads. But that that, that wasn't just anarchists. the punk scene. That was taking over into the skinhead scene. Yeah. I know what you're talking sure. about, though. That, that the original uh, dress sense of red braces and yeah, docks yeah. was not racist. It sure. was just... And it's been co-opted, that yeah, yeah. public image. Aye. Sorry, continue. Yeah. But also, like... The, so whereas in in the US punk there was a lot more of sure it being more more just straight up anti establishment and being uh -huh. able to say whatever the fuck you wanted mm -hmm. and yeah you you've got me on that one guys like when I talk about what punk is you have to take me on what I mean when I'm talking about the idea of what punk is his cultural optic yeah so when I talk about uh, black lives matter being the most punk thing it's from that perspective of what I think of when I think of punk but if you think of punk as being a different thing substitute out the word punk for the thing that is like uh anti-establishment and anti-racism like and to, to me punk uh in my experience of dealing with with punks and growing up around all, all people like that it was all unbelievably anti-racism absolutely yeah, and like so, would fight to the death to um, defend people yeah that was that was where that came from but uh, i'm glad a lot of you called me on that and disagreed with me because open open more discussion so um, yes how fucking good is discussion with good people I absolutely love it. yeah no absolutely, absolutely fucking lutely. but uh, on that point go and listen to hellfire thunderbolt and come back to us and no doubt your comments will be rotten yeah and well 
it kind of fits in line with that punk thing like the punk thing is saying something it's doing something it's always about saying something even if that thing is anti-racism if that thing is pro-racism even if that thing is anarchism well, even i mean it's funny you're saying pro-racism is... pro you're talking about tim ripper owns <laughs> and even if the uh the thing that they're saying is we can say whatever the fuck we want right mm-hmm. i get that like mm-hmm. the hardcore scene came out of that idea of saying whatever the fuck we want type type thing which i'm sure well i don't want to say i'm sure because my, my dad grew up on the on the punk thing and then when he started his bands and was doing what he would have just considered hardcore punk you guys came to call grindcore which went on and influenced an entire further generation of, of people so i I've, always love that, that i've got my, my punk mind. cred okay it also upsets me that your dad said i'm not responsible for this when you let me hear party cannon yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I know uh, I don't want to say I know what I'm talking about when I when I talk about you punk, have lived just, you have lived experience. Yeah, just consider that when I talk about punk, I'm not saying I'm an I'm an expert, but I'm I'm coming from a place of um, actual uh, lived familiarity experience. Yeah. Yes, I um, mean your dad did start extreme noise terror. <laughs> let's let's just cause. I don't know if I'd give him the credit for that though, because it wasn't his idea. He not was the just point. There. He was a yeah, founding yeah, member. Yeah, yeah, sure. you, you wouldn't, for the same reason, be like, well, Shane Embury hasn't allowed to see anything because <laughs> he was just part of. A uh, fucking oh, with, oh, the names are right in my head. Scum. Uh, oh, like the, fucking the most famous Napalm Death, the most okay. famous like grind band of yeah. that time. Yeah, yeah. But that was round about the same time, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, very much the same idea as well. Um, but the point I was saying there was like Sorry. punk is always about saying something. There's always yes. people saying something. Whereas Hellfire Thunderbolt feels like the worst thing it can, you can possibly have in terms of lyrics and songwriting for me, which is buzzwords you know what i mean it just feels like let's just throw buzzwords at you i could write their next song for them as well and it's fucking um uh i don't want to use the word thunder again let's go um uh angry bees catastrophe <laughs> screaming death march there you go i've written you screaming song. Death march! yeah you know, that could that could easily and i'm sure the thing is when we do that we laugh and go huh, that's fucking dumb but i can imagine kk like waking up at night and going screaming death and just no, going, no. I've got it, I've got the next one. He's watching a podcast and right away he's got the notepad at the <laughs> fuck, what can I do? That's the next hit. So, um, Better yeah. some writing credits out here, boys. Now, of course, we're going to probably upset a lot of people by having said all of this because there's probably a bunch of you guys out there that listen to this and really into it, but like ultimately, I'm, I'm just not into it. So, Form your own opinions. The guitar in it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's, it's um, not revolutionary. But, um, speaking of. Speaking of. What, what, are you going to say not revolutionary or revolutionary? Yeah, super, super quick one because I want to get onto onto this. Um, we, have a, we have definitely been ripping the piss today, haven't we? In sense of... Uh, times? We were, Actually, no, it's we not too bad. I thought we were good, 20 minutes. I thought we were a good two hours in, sorry. No. Just because we've, we've done less news and more chat. Yeah. Um, it's nice. It's nice. So Def's Chuck Schuldner has been honoured with a stealth guitar from BC Rich. Yes. And we talked about Mike's experience with the BC Rich stealth many times and actually i saw a bunch of people share this on facebook and they all said one well, then they all say some of them had, had clearly owned stealths and they said the same thing which was as long as it's better than the pile of shit that i used to have <laughs> the thing is right and i had this in the comment section with somebody else on like chug life or something right it's a facebook group if anybody's interested for like people who are interested in heavy guitar and pointy guitars and high gain amps etc um someone had posted about this story um just before we posted about it in the group and they were commenting on it and blah, blah, blah. And my comment was, I have owned one of these. If this is going to be anything like the one I had before, the build quality is great. The problem is the design. Because the neck was like a baseball bat. Mm. It was so neck heavy that it just wouldn't balance. And the X2N, well, I do like it as a pickup, is very, very tailored to a specific audience. And it's very, very picky about amps and EQ settings. It is, if you don't get it right, it sounds horrible and shrill. Yeah. And anyone that's listened to Death knows that Chuck Schuldner's tone did have that kind of shrill, high-end, fizzy bite to it, especially yeah. in the later stuff, um, because he was using the Marshall Valve states and an X2N. So he's pushing the fuck out of this solid-state amp that's supposedly hybrid. It had a valve in it, but it may as well just have been an ornament. Um, <laughs> because I had one of those. Funnily enough, it was the first head I ever bought by accident. It was the same one he used. Um <laughs> But that was like where I, that's what I could see. I was like, I don't think anything else is bad on it. Like the hardware was solid. The build was solid. It was the first guitar I had with an ebony fretboard and ebony was lovely. The inlays were really well done. Um, the finish was cracking. The body shape was cracking. It was, it was, it was a cool guitar, but it was only cool to look at. See, when you held it, it was just like, mm, something's not right here. Yeah. And then I saw um, the Pat O'Brien signature. Have you saw that before? No. It's a seven string. 
Stealth with EMGs oh, and a Floyd Rose. And that, I've played one of those. That is a different level of stealth. It's beautiful, man. Just... Is, is it the Pat O'Brien? Maybe I'm talking shit. Maybe it's somebody else's signature. Uh, but I'm pretty certain it was Pat... Unless I'm thinking of Pat O'Brien because he played the stealth in one of the videos for the release. Uh, stealth. Oh, no. It might have been... Somebody else. Yeah, Pat just seems to stick to the uh, the V. Mark Rizzo. Sorry, it was Mark Rizzo. I'm thinking of Pat O'Brien because there's a video of him playing the stealth when they first released the first Chuck and he was playing Cannibal Corpse riffs. Sorry, there we are. Now that, as a guitar, I know it's not the same as what Chuck had. It's close enough. But that blew the, the stealth I had yeah. out the water. Mm. Like, blew it out the water. Completely... Um, Dustin, friend of mine who plays in a band called Autistic Oscopy, and wasn't, uh, I don't know if he's still in the band actually. Torturous Inception, I don't know right. if he's still in the band. Anyway, incredible musician. He had one of those and he played it every night on tour, and it just was one of those guitars that was solid, sounded great, and looked great. Just was. Yeah. It's cool. Great prices on them apparently as well. Here's one selling on Reverb for £773. That is in Canada, so it's maybe cheaper if you found one here. Sure. I um, don't think it was all that common a model in the UK. Sure, but uh, yeah, that beautiful, 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 beautiful. Um, yeah, I got I, you know pointy guitars like that. It's it's uh, I, I find it really fascinating when um, there there has to have come a time in guitar design where something like the visual side of thing was much more not more important, but became as important as the function. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like because. Nobody is going to argue that the design of this guitar is for function. It's it's not, it's not helping. It's purely aesthetic. Yeah, there um, might be some part of it that has got ergonomics in mind. For example, it might be that the the top back horn is a bit longer for wire. balance. Yeah. exactly. But I know what you're saying. The the general consensus is you're not picking a wild body shape because you think it'll sit nicer. You're yeah. picking a wild body shape because you think it looks cool. Yeah. So and there's just a world of um, I don't like people that criticise pointy guitars for that reason you know pointy guitars they're, they're dumb they're absolutely not they just have to it always goes in line with a with a certain style it's an influence thing isn't it if you've grown up seeing all your heroes play pointy guitars because that style of music tends to have pointy guitars you're probably going to like the look of pointy guitars generally speaking i'm not hugely into pointy guitars the pointiest guitar i own obviously is my my mick thompson which is pointy enough it's pretty pointy but plenty, plenty pointy Pretty point, pretty pointy, and I wouldn't like that guitar if it had the regular BC Rich headstock. I like it because it's got the widow headstock on it, mm -hmm. which is additional pointiness. So it looks like it's got balls cut out of it. Uh, so yeah, um, there are two versions of this guitar being released. There's a cheap um, version, and there is a much more expensive uh, USA version. The Chuck USA. So that's. Is uh, there more details on like the parts or anything? Is it just going to be the same as what his was? Which is they've hashtagged um, Spurzel, hashtag Demarcionic. Uh, Hashtag Tone Pros. The Marzio Inc. That that does. I I assumed that was a a pickup type. Sorry, a a not a brand. Like a, a model. Signature a model. model. Yeah. yeah, it's the next two in. It's the Marzio the, Inc. Yes, that. I just noticed it when I saw it there. Um, it did. No, I don't remember Chuck's having spares. This is tuners. why you fucking capitalize. Yes, <laughs> uh, the Tone Pros bridge was definitely the one I had because it's I'm the sorry, same guys, wraparound. I, need to, I have to retire from music now. That's me. You need your bed, son. Yeah. Um, but I didn't have spares on mine. However, I've had spares on pretty much all of my guitars yeah. except my Ormus piece, and I really, really liked them. And I didn't see the point in changing to spares because all the hardware that I've got on my guitar is Ormus based slash hip shot and is already a lot on machine heads. Yeah. No point in changing to spares. Mm. But I've had other guitars that have done that. Um, in fact, the first guitar I had spares on was my Mustang V. I'm just. Um... And what a difference. Just staying yeah. in tune all the time. I'm just not into this in the slightest. That's okay. It's just a bare bones. No, this is this is a death metal telecaster. <laughs> Look well, at it, meat tatties. Sure, I I put it this way. Like, <laughs> um, it to me this is the I see where you're coming from with that, and it's the same argument that I would make about a telecaster, which is a telecaster should never be over a thousand dollars. Is it simple, bare bones to the point? There's nothing spectacular about it. Yeah, they're cost effective. This is that. This is a wraparound bridge. It's got one pickup in it. It's a neck bolted onto a body. Yeah, I think it's next through. Okay. But again, point stands. Simple. I mean, I could even argue even more simple in terms of design. Mm -hmm. um, Less parts to bolt together and hope they fit. Yeah. So 
such a simple design, it should be cheap. This should be a cost-effective instrument, and you just know that that Chuck USA is going to be horrendously expensive. I think I would justify that where it the case that the money or some of the profits are going back to Chuck's family. Yeah. Or to, I know that there was some uh, unreleased recordings and stuff found right. in Chuck's estate. His yeah. family still handled the estate. They were selling stuff off. Yeah. We were speaking about it a few years ago. Yeah. Um, like the, the big uh, backdrop and stuff. Yeah. Um, I think they are trying to get those mixed and mastered professionally so they can potentially release it and whatever else. They've also just put out a deaf tab book. So. Oh, that's pretty fucking cool, man. So, um, yeah. So, Hopefully this is not just relapse cashing in and that's yeah. it, that, that Chuck's not dime too. But <laughs> yeah. anyway. Um, All right. Let's, let's do it. Let's move on to our main story. Um, not this this I... is going to be quite a contentious one in the comments, I think, because people are going to have their opinions on it. Yeah, for Especially me this considering is like this a... is a... Like, I don't want to say they're a Marmite band, but certainly everybody's got their opinion on them. Yeah, so Foo Fighters will be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this year. Iron Maiden will not. Um... I'm going to preface this by saying the order in which people get inducted into a, and no, I'm going to preface that by saying a rock and roll, a hall of fame is irrelevant. It does not fucking matter. Mm -hmm. um, a band's fandom or their actual fans are considerably more important than an organization giving you that recognition. Yes. Yeah. So there's that. And then the order that people are inducted into said hall of fame does not equal how important that person is into to the history of of the thing um i'll pull it over to wrestling super briefly people thought it was really odd that this year in uh for the hall of fame for the wwe kane was inducted into the into the hall of fame now of course kane is a legendary like mike's not into wrestling but mike knows who kane is of course i do because kane's iconic um i loved wrestling when i was younger but Just you know who's not in the hall of fame the yeah, undertaker chris benoit they will, yeah. The Undertaker's not in the Hall of Fame. And Eddie the key word is the key word is yet. Yes. You know? Like, for all we know, maybe the Hall of Fame want to induct Maiden into the Hall of Fame as like a huge ceremony when they get to a massive anniversary. They just want to make it this huge thing. Well the I liken this story to when everybody was losing their shit that Leonardo DiCaprio didn't have a fucking Oscar. Yeah. It's the same thing. Like it's gonna happen. Yeah. You can't deny that the arc the artwork he has done that the contributions he's made aren't incredibly vast and well received. Yeah. And the very fact that people are kicking up about the fact that that's not been recognised, A, proves you don't need the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame slash the Oscars, and B, that it's going to be a matter of time before it actually happens. So I'm uh, evidently I'm not up on recent Foo Fighters. Um mm -hmm. but there's a photo here of uh, of who I assume to be the Foo Fighters. I have to say I assume Pats, yeah. Because I see six people there. And That's there. right. Patch me I, remember, plays guitar. I know that, but who's the guy on the far right? I don't... I always thought of... Uh, That's a good point. I don't you know, know. Of course, the first Foo Fighters album was just Dave. Mm -hmm. And then I always thought of Foo Fighters as being a four-piece band mm -hmm. with Pat occasionally doing like second, uh, third guitar duty. Uh, he was in the My Hero video, wasn't he? Yeah. Um... But yeah, apparently, apparently, Foo Fighters are a six piece now. Um, oh well. <laughs> Who else did Pat Smear play on? He played on another band. Uh, he did. Um, I'm sure he did additional guitars in Nirvana, didn't he? He might have done. I know he was in another band outside of that, though, like another grunge band. Mm. It wasn't a Hole. Um, I don't think it was Butthole Surfers or anything like that either. I don't know. Um, um, I like. I like Don't scroll down. We'll find out who that sixth person is. But I. Uh, I well, don't think it will be listed in there. I just, I'll. Uh... It, it was you just had a list there. Okay, hang on. I was telling you on that article no, who no, the members were. just because I was half, half time gone. See, so look, Fran Stahl, a former member, sorry, Foo Fighters current lineup we inducted bassist Nate Mandel, guitarist Pat Smear, also ex Nirvana, so you're right, yeah, yeah. and uh, Chris Shifflett, a drummer Taylor Hawkins will join band leader and frontman Dave Grohl. Former members William Goldsmith and Fran Stahl will not be inducted. Is that them in this photo? One of them, maybe? No, this is right. They've been getting banned photos and some cunts just walked up for the street. And he's like, I'm getting in on this, by the way. I've got to tell all my pals I'm in the Foo Fighters now. If Pat Smear can join in, so can I. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I'm not going to have people talk shit about Foo Fighters. Absolutely right? not. Because, um, I will not stand for it. Dave Grohl is a fucking god and that's the end of it. Yeah, he's um he's immensely talented. He's a great songwriter. He looks awfully like the guy from Nirvana. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's... um. Yeah, I think he's just immensely talented, immensely um, awesome. That I do humble. 
Well, yeah, no, I, w- I will give you that. But I would also point out that uh, I've been seeing an interview doing the rounds recently uh, from Nirvana back in the day uh, where they were talking about ticket prices um, and how they feel about other bands charging more than they are for ticket prices. And they hadn't even considered it. They were like, how much are we charging? And they looked at each other like, I don't know, like 18, 19 bucks to, to come and see us. And then the interviewer pointed out that like other bands were charging like 35 and they all just burst out laughing. We're like, no, no, we'd never, no, we wouldn't want to put, a, you'd never put, you should never put up barriers like that between you and your fans. Like if people want to, we're just grateful that people were willing to pay 20 bucks to come and see us play. Mm-hmm. I don't think Foo Fighters tickets are all that cheap now. So it's nice to see Dave's changed his, uh... I, I don't think I would attribute that to him directly. I think there's a big difference in the, uh, the popularity and the, and Nirvana well they played in the market they played in, record labels, etc., mm-hmm. and the people they played for, versus the Foo Fighters. If because Dave Nirvana Grohl... never wanted to be sure. mainstream, certainly at least uh, Kurt didn't. Let's not pretend, though, if, if Dave Grohl wanted to go out with the Foo Fighters and never charge more than $20 for a ticket, he could do that. Uh... I'm not saying he should, but he could. See, I think they've actually done secret gigs where they've done that yeah. kind of stuff and they've booked themselves under Taylor Hawkins' band name and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I would also think that a big part of that might well be the record labels that are behind them because it's not as if they're not making a lot of money off of Dave and the Foo Fighters. Yeah. They're a commercial, big commercial band. They sell stadiums. I'd be really interested, right, to see if... Um, if you were a band as big as the Foo Fighters, mm-hmm. you can play a stadium and you can charge, let's say, $80 a ticket, just mm-hmm. for argument's sake, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you were to put your ticket prices down... Mm-hmm. Do you think that you could play a much bigger space, like like festival size spaces, just because tickets are cheaper, more people will come? You would need to factor in the cost of more security, the land, sure, all that kind of stuff. If it was financially feasible, I imagine it would be more people. I'm and certainly I... not talking about it being more profitable. I know no, that it probably wouldn't crowd. be as. But yeah, as a musician, mm-hmm. my goal is to reach as many people as humanly possible. We mm-hmm. do a podcast mm-hmm. for free. Because it's much more effective for us to do a podcast for free that there are probably 120 people listening to literally live right now um, than By it would way, be for us to... 125 people at the one time last week? Yeah. Fucking... <laughs> God bless you. Not that I believe in God yeah. personally, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, we could put it behind a paywall, but that would it would just kind of end up on the point. Anyway, let's go with this. So, Where's the fun in having a community that you have to pay to get into? Yeah. Fuck that. <laughs> uh, so I don't take any issue with the Foo Fighters being inducted into the Hall of Fame because I think that uh, I... I've never actually really been that into Iron Maiden. I've just never been. And the reason for that is because I listened to Racer X before I listened to Iron Maiden. So when I went and listened to Iron Maiden, I was like, okay, cool. This is like a slightly tamed down version of Water the thing that I love. Yes. Um, Depends on the album. I don't have anything bad to say about Iron Maiden. Like you can put on any Iron Maiden record and I thoroughly enjoy it. But um, Iron Maiden was my first ever gig. Yeah. It was a funeral for a friend who supported. <laughs> and they were dynamite. But yeah. uh, they started a chant for Iron Maiden. And then they started the next song, and you couldn't hear the next song over the chants. Yeah, stupid move. Yeah. But it was good. <laughs> uh, I saw Maiden quite a lot of times. I've sure. saw Maiden at Donington. Mm. Um, aye, but I get what you're saying. Like, it's the same as being a Judas Priest fan. You know what you're getting. Yeah, I I just think like even someone like me that doesn't really consider themselves a big a big Maiden fan, um, they're definitely like Hall of Fame worthy. Um, and I also don't consider myself a big Foo Fighters fan, but. Given the choice, here's the controversial one. Iron Maiden are playing in town tonight and the Foo Fighters are playing in town tonight and I've got free tickets to both of them. I'm probably going to go and see the Foo Fighters. So would I, actually. So, um, and that's because I've seen the Foo Fighters once, right. but I've seen Iron Maiden about nine times. I mean, I acknowledge that Maiden would be a more spectacular, bombastic show. I think it would depend on the set list, actually. What are you thinking about it? Yeah. If, if I knew it was going to be a really good set list for Iron Maiden, I'd maybe go to that. I kind of am like regretting saying it now. Um, because it, yeah, I'm not sure I would. I guess I said that in the heat of the moment, and I apologise for that. But <laughs> I said it in the heat of the moment. But I, I'm trying to illustrate this idea that to me, the Foo Fighters are a huge, a, a fantastic band. They really, they really are. I mm. think um, you can talk about all of their songs as much as you as much as you like. They have a ton of great songs. If even if you got rid of all of them and just left with the song "The Pretender." I would be quite happy with that because that is a smashing song. So, um, cracking riff, well written, lots of suspense, great vocals. Yeah. Just the Foo Fighters are the back, man. It's just yeah. every part of it is a Foo Fighters banger. You know what? Yeah. See, when I first heard Rope, mm. 
I was like, fuck me, that's such a cool riff. Who could come up with that? And then I heard the chorus and I'm like, that's Dave Grohl. Yeah. That's that's the foot that's the foos? Yeah. And I was listening to it and I'm like He's been hanging out with Josh Holm far too much. <laughs> and funnily enough, Josh Holm is on one of the songs on you one can't by one. Possibly hang around with one uh, by one with Josh too much because uh, Dave on Songs from the Deaf. Um, songs for the Deaf, sorry. Uh, obviously, everyone thinks of um, what an album, by the way. I know everyone always thinks of uh, No One Knows because that was like a huge, huge hit for them. Um, I would actually. Uh, here, here's the kind of point that the how important music videos are. The music video for No One Knows is fantastic. Go with the flow. It is a great song. Go with the flow is such a good song, but the music video for it for me is so off putting, hard to watch. Do you, you think, think so? I love it. I think it's incredible. It's, I mean, it's really cool, but it's so overly sexual. I'm not even going to go with the sexual sexual thing. It's just, it's intense. Graphic, graphically startling. Graphically intense, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I get you with that point. I totally get you. But I do like that. I think that's part of the charm of it. Yeah. Um, another music video, fun enough, talking about Dave Grohl. You know uh, the Foo Fighters song Low? Yeah. From One by One. Yeah. You saw the music video for that? No. We need to watch this after. If you've not seen yeah. it, go into the music video. It's so funny. Yeah. So it's Dave dressed up like a hillbilly meets Jack Black dressed up like a hillbilly and they both look really sketchy pulling shit out of their pickup trucks and whatever else and they go into a motel room and then it's handy cam footage of the two of them just being nuts and it's so fucking interesting yeah. we need to watch it after this because yeah, it's we'll do that. dynamite um, and reason, it's a great tune the reason I thought we'd go with this is because uh, it was an opportunity for us to look at the actual Hall of Fame and to look for artists that are, have been inducted into the Hall of Fame Yes, because I think that People that get up in arms about this idea of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, um, and they're like, well, of course Iron Maiden should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Like, maybe they don't know the types of people that are actually in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. For example, Etta James is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Leo Fender is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, Iron Maiden are one of the most important metal bands, but rock and roll as a concept is much broader than just, you know, than the metal. Oh, absolutely. Um, the Beatles are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I mean, I didn't check that, but I would they imagine... Are. They are. We, we scrambled past okay, it. The okay. Beatles are definitely in there. But the Jackson 5 and every member of the Jackson 5 individually are listed yeah. in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Leonard Cohen yeah. is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Jelly Roll Morton is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But, so there's 338 inductees in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And we can search by artists. So I thought we'd just, I'd just throw some names. We could just bounce some names off, his, off of each other mm -hmm. of who you might think is in and who you wouldn't think would be in. Mm -hmm. So, seeing as we've already talked about them on the show today, a Judas Priest in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? I would say no. Let's find out. Judas, 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 Judas. No. Zero results found. No Judas Find Priest. us up on the screen so people can see it while we're doing it. So they believe us. <laughs> Don't want me to think that we are lying or omitting information. Um, so I'll throw a name out there. I was going to say Slipknot. Of course, Slipknot aren't in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Focus. Focus? Jan Ackerman's Focus. Wow. Because um, they fucking should be. You think? You don't? You you name me one person on this planet that doesn't know about Hocus Pocus by Well, Focus. I see. I was just going to say Hocus Pocus. I'll give you that. But but what about songs outside of Hocus Pocus? Don't matter. Focus is there. Um, and Jan Ackerman, you can't deny, was probably one of the pioneers of shred guitar despite not being named as such i might actually give it to you i might i might say yes on that one i can see that nope switch this off horror i'm done i'm walking it <laughs> horror uh, but genuinely i mean you think jan, uh, jan ackerman himself will be on there you could probably just search jan no jan no, Janet Jackson, Janis Joplin, and Janice Wenner. So, okay, I've got another one for you. Uh huh. Genesis. Phil Collins might be on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, by the way. Maybe not Genesis. But saying that, if they're going to put Phil Collins on, they're going to definitely have to put in fucking, what do you call him? Red Rain is for Peter Gabriel. Red Rain. Sorry, this is clapping like fuck. Genesis. Parliament Funkadelic. Yeah. Steely Dan. So, aye, right kind of made the point here then it's a lot of old rockers t-rex yeah are there don't fire a band at me older than you oh wait i've got one avenge sevenfold 
But no, they're not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I know they're not, and they never will be. <laughs> <laughs> Trapped. But I'm sure one day Lucas Mann will be. <laughs> oh no, he'll he'll start his own. Um, any other, uh, any other? Because I'm just trying to go for that that angle of like, um, well, Iron Maiden aren't in, but other bands that we would deem to be maybe smaller who are, or other bands that we would deem to be bigger who aren't. The White Stripes. The what? No, no, they can't be. No. I think that's a good one though because they are very commercially accepted. I don't think they've got a long enough history. Do, 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 do. No, they are not. They I was going to look there. for. I was going to look for yes. Um, and yeah, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Nice. So we're we're definitely talking like we're talking old. That's old. what I'm saying. It's it's clearly an old boys club. Um, I mean, Steely Dan was on there, and so it's, it is going to be all these aged rockers in it. But there's also like Miles Davis is in there, and Billy Holiday's in there. Like there's people that have made a substantial contribution, uh, contribution or a change to uh, the music industry. I think is probably where they're going with. Yeah. Um. Iron Maiden will absolutely make it to the As Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And the Rock and Roll Hall oh, of Fame. Oh, yeah, 100%. Fucking better be. Yeah. Yes, 2004. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that a solid um, a, a solid guess. Oh, it'd have to be, wouldn't it? About Rick James. Rick James, bitch. What do you think? Uh, I hope so. No. No? James okay. Taylor is, though? Yeah. So, yeah. The the idea, Elmore James is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Wow. So the, Early influences, 1992. Yeah. So it's, it's obviously people who have had a con, considerable effect yeah. on the industry in general. So basically what we're saying, guys, is don't worry. Iron Maiden will make it. They'll get there. There's no doubt that Iron Maiden will make it to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because they're Hall of Fame worthy. And even if they don't, who fucking cares? Exactly. We still love the band. They're still there. They're still putting music out. It's not like they've decided they're going on strike until their name's put in there. I'm going to just scroll through these and I want you to jump out a name that uh, that jumps out to you as someone that maybe shouldn't be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Okay. I'm seeing names I don't know. Down. Oh, you can get David Bowie off there. No, thank you. You behave yourself. Because <laughs> if we're just going by bands that we don't like, there's probably going to be quite a lot not on there. Cheap Trick? Ah, uh, okay. Like Eric Clapton. Bit of a push. Eric Clapton's definitely a push. Speaking of pushing. Oh, there was no push involved in that, was there? Sorry. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. No, fair. I just saw Cream and thought David Elson. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, I know I'm making jokes about things that Deep Purple, aye, obviously. You know, for, for, I love Deep Purple, don't get me wrong, but for for Deep Purple to be in there and Maiden to not be? For strange. Death Leopard to be in there and Maiden to not be? Yeah. Um, definitely, definitely strange. Dire Straits. Yeah, good famous Glasgow band, Dire Straits. <laughs> aye, that's right, that's right. The Scottish <laughs> front man. Um, Leo, Leo Fender, I mentioned that earlier. Aretha Franklin. No, totally not rock and roll, but kind of formed the roots Huge of rock and roll as well yeah. to be honest through that kind of yeah. blues and jazz Marvin Gaye very nice Al Green, Green oh Green Day that feels like a bit Guns and Roses Buddy Guy Guns and Roses to be in there is astonishing when you think about it when you know as far as I'm concerned they've only released I'm, I'm not going to upset people and say two albums because uh people are never going to agree with us on Chinese democracy but if Chinese democracy didn't exist I would be happy to just say one album worth listening to and what's that use your delusion uh, appetite, appetite. Yeah. that's alright then yeah. so I was going to say we're going to have an instant here if you start talking about other albums than that one <laughs> no exactly but uh, no I agree with you in Chinese democracy I fucking love it I think okay. it's a great album Journey are in there that's well deserved Kiss I was going to say Kiss but you knew they were going to be yeah, there because Gene Simmons has paid his way in <laughs> He probably owns the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> Not being silly, yeah. probably does. Here's a question. Mm. Would a band like Megadeth ever make it? If Metallica did, mm. why wouldn't they? Well, because they're nowhere near as commercially um, NWA. But they ha you can't deny that they've had an influence the same of, are the same as, if not slightly smaller than Metallica on the rock and roll and metal community. Mm. That's undeniable. Obviously, Queen. Obviously, Queen was in there. Bonnie Wright's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That's oh, that's cool. I see Jimmy Reed, but no, but no Jerry Reed. 
motherfuckers. Big sad cunts. He's Neil Rogers. Him. Big Neil. Go on yourself, son. Run DMC. Rush. Mm -hmm. Santana. Tupac. Slide the Family Stone. Phil Spector. Oh, Steely Ringo Dan. Star. Fuck him. Musical excellence. Aye, yeah, right. Behave yourself. <laughs> no, actually, I can't say that because if there's one thing that you, you actually can't take away from the Beatles is that the songwriting is tremendous. There is, there is no way to say around about it. Tom Waits? Tom Waits in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? <laughs> <laughs> of course. Stevie Wonder. Never seen that coming. ZZ Top, nice. nice. I'm making great puns and you're fucking not even laughing. I know, I know. I... <laughs> Um, yeah, cool. So, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, don't, as I keep saying, don't get too upset about Maiden not being in there. They'll get in there, and there are a bunch of bands that will be in there. And if they don't, fuck lives. them. We'll start our own Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with Blackjack and Hookers. Yeah, well, well, for us, it's just um, we 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 have better than the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, don't we? We have the honorary guitar souls, and we've given the honorary guitar soul to at this stage, I believe, one person, which was Steve Lukather. That's right. He said Steve Lukather could be can be an honorary guitar soul because he just didn't give a fuck during his interviews. He just doesn't give a fuck. Nah, so he just says what he wants. I would to say, say Devin gets a number two for putting a phone up his ass. Okay, so I'm going to end. Uh, we're going to end the show by inducting two more people into the, the guitar more? souls. Yeah, two more, two, two more, more people into the honorary guitar souls. Mm -hmm. uh, one is going to be Devin Townsend. Mm -hmm. Absolutely fair, putting a putting a phone up his ass and just generally being um, not giving a fuck. And I feel Paul Gilbert after the. Uh, all right, that, take the piss at Yngwie. Yep, yeah, yep, yep, yep. Yeah, that's Especially the getting away with it in front of Yngwie, but not other people. And then owning it up to it years later. Oh, aye, aye. That's, um, that's cool. I like that's that. pretty guitar solely. So. <laughs> is it though? Because I don't mean this in like any bad way, but like I think when I think of guitar solely, I'm just not giving a fuck. But Paul's clearly like, I mean, I'll obviously upset something. I wasn't trying to be wide, but I was just trying to be funny. He seems very gentile in that regard. I think we're that way too, though. Ah, I wouldn't want to upset yeah. MD properly. You're right, you're right. Yeah, we just like to poke fun, but if anyone... We're not dickheads, genuinely... we're guitar souls. Exactly. So, there you go. Two two more inductees into the uh, the Guitar Soul Hall of Fame, the yes. honorary guitar souls. In uh, fact, where we're at it then, gsoulsfanmail at gmail.com. If you have a story that would get you inducted into the Guitar Souls Hall of Fame, get it fucking sent. See, some people might take issue with the start of the show where I say, I am one of your hosts, Mr. Levi Clay, and I am here with my good... And I say one of your hosts because Mike is also a host of the show and he's mm -hmm. just showing why right there. Thanks, Look at him floating ideas. Thanks, Obviously, I'm going to have to edit that out of the show. <laughs> Get him off that fucking crown. I'm here to tell you things, okay? Brilliant. I'm constantly just here to tell people about new and exciting things. For example, did you know... This show is brought to you by our friends over at Ormsby Guitars and I want to let you guys know that now is the time to get involved on their upcoming Run 16 guitars. Now there's some incredible guitars here available for your money starting as low as $1,400. That is an incredible price for some cutting edge guitar technology. Starting up first, we have the Run 16 Hype GTRs, available in a variety of colours, 6, 7 and 8 string models. You can also get your hands on a Metal X, again in a variety of colours and different string variations. You can also purchase the Metal V Headless, which is my choice of the bunch, absolutely stunning, especially in that Dragon Burst. Absolutely beautiful instrument, super cool, imagine that in an 8 string, you know you want it. And then finally, we have the Hype 6 GTR Ando San Signature Model. Again, another Hype GTR available in 6, 7 and 8 string models. So as always, a huge thanks to our friends and family over at Ormsby Guitars. You guys are absolutely awesome. Thank you very much for your continued generosity and support. We love you very, very much. And we look forward to hanging out with you guys at NAM and uh, telling us if NAM ever happens again. Of I know. <laughs> I mean, if it doesn't, I've also floated the idea to Perry that you and I could maybe go over and get on the guitar building course. Yeah. Because I think that would be something I would, I mean, I want to do it regardless of whether I'm over there filming it or doing it in partnership. Yeah. It's something that's been on my bucket list. Yeah. And I thought it was just an apt time to mention that when we were talking about like, it was kind of strange because obviously you and I were mulling over it for a bit and then we made the proposition and the reply was basically, sure, what do you want to do? Yeah. And I was like, all right, okay, that's yeah. quite the negotiation. Sure, what do you want to do? <laughs> yeah. All right. And then it was, it was at that point we kind of were floating ideas. Obviously you and I, not being greedy people, not looking for anything stupid and totally understanding our own value and worth, we're like, just want to be reasonable about it. 
But then I had to get in a wee shot the Ferrari just for a laugh. And then Perry came and was like, well, we'll talk about that when you come over. And I was like, <laughs> when we come over? Mm, why would I want to go to Australia and see the, the factory? I definitely want to build a guitar. So that was a, that was nice. Yeah. That was nice. So they're, uh, they're, they're good chaps. Yes. And, um, you know, further sponsorships are on their way. Uh, whiskey sponsorship is still ongoing. It will happen. Don't you don't you worry about that. We did have someone actually reach out to us and let us know that the uh, the Petrucci whiskey is sold out now. Of course it is. So um, a two hundred dollars a bottle. Listen, if it's nice whiskey and people are big fans of Dream Theater or John Petrucci and they're mm-hmm. collectors or whatever, fucking fill your boots. Sure. Just it's quite interesting to see a lot of musicians go down the music business route, but actually just go more in the business route outside yeah, yeah. of their st- yeah. standard protocols. So um, yeah, who knows? Maybe we'll be blessed in apparel sometime soon. I don't... <laughs> Been nice, wasn't it? Just the funniest, funniest thing in in the world there. So us blessing a barrel. The, it's never going to happen, but the notion is so ridiculous. You know what I'm telling you? It like could that. happen. As I say, a good friend of mine, actually an ex-bandmate of mine, yeah. runs his own rum company. He's in with a lot of distilleries. Tell it. And you know what? Right? You know what? I'm going to speak Mate, to him. I'm how gonna... do you think this whiskey thing's come about? It's by mutual contacts. Of course it so. is. It's always the same. It's who you know, know what so, you know. Exactly. So go and... It's always the same. If you can bring something funny to the table, if anyone listening to the show can offer, can bring things to the table, can br- bring interesting partnerships. If you have a company and you want to do something fun with the guitar souls, we're sitting here and talking about blessing a whiskey barrel, right? Anything fun, we are on board with. Absolutely. So. And if you want to just call us corporate horrible sellout shells, gsoulsfanmail at gmail.com. There is that. But let's throw this additional thing here as a closing thought, right? Uh-huh. It could easily come across that we're horrible corporate shills willing to take payment from anybody in order to promote what it is that they have to offer yes we've not taken a penny from ormsby no nope. we have not we never took a penny from daniel no nope. we never took up we are not taking a penny from the company that we're about to launch uh, a deal with correct we'll take some product sure but only product that we we want Absolutely. Know, only product Stuff that, that we all... like things that we're going to actually use and get some some enjoyment out of i think even beyond that stuff that we've got a track history with mm. like we ormsby but uh, we we addressed it in one of the previous emails talking about buying these guitars without trying them. I did take the plunge with my first guitar with Ormsby, but I knew enough about the brand not to worry about it. Yeah. And certainly to know what I was getting into. It wasn't just like, a, oh, fuck, there's a brand that's brand new and these guitars look amazing. The pictures are great. The deals are great. Yeah. Is this too good to be true or will I take a punt at it? So we've been hands-on with them. Yeah. Been hands-on with Daniel stuff. I bought an amp off him. Yeah. And I fucking love it. As I say, it's back at him in the moment, getting modded and a wee service and stuff. I can't wait to get back. Um, although I did tell him, just put it in the back burner, you've got plenty on. Yeah. <laughs> As you know, he's yeah. fucking the busiest guy on the planet. Yeah. But that's it. As you say, it, I would be happy to be called a corporate shill and take that on board because if people think that we are just being weird and profiteering, then that's cool. That's totally a valid opinion. Sure. We're big boys. We can take that. We're just at the moment being very lucky. After a year of shit, but I think the thing is, like, if we were profiteering, we'd tell you. So I was going to oh, say I... we would never go down that route. But actually, I was going to say, like, if because I, I looked over there, I was like looking around, I saw sunglasses. I was like, if a sunglasses company contacted us mm-hmm. and said, we would like for you to, we'd like to run an ad on your show and we'll pay you, um, we'll pay you 500 pounds for the month to, to, to run ads on the show. Um, I wanted to say that I'd say no to that, but actually I wouldn't because that would actually be really helpful for our NAM trip type thing. It would. I think I would say no because it's not relevant to the channel. But However, that's the point. We'd we'd let you know that. We, yeah. Yeah. It would be like, you know, this is, uh, these aren't the products that we've purchased or anything like that. This is a, a sponsorship. So please do go and check them out. It helps yes. the channel. And that's very different to what we've got going with, with the guys at Ormsby. Mm-hmm. M- but they aren't giving us money. We use the gear. We like the gear. So um, it, it works in Abdi's favor. We, yeah get other guitars we get bits and bobs to play with that we are already using and they get more uh, exposure from people who are genuinely interested in the product it's yeah. not like we're getting a box and going right we're going to unbox it and we don't know anything about it and we'll give you our initial thoughts it's like we know pretty much what we're in for which yeah. is nice it's nice yeah. and it's actually for me really really nice to feel that there are brands out there that see a bit of value in us too which it's a nice pat in the back it is it really is um and i I would like to think we're not taking advantage of that in any way. We're actually, we, we must be providing some sort of benefit at a mutual level back yeah. for brands to want to invest in us, which is nice. It's nice. Yeah. Because I think you're probably the same as me. You, you consider these things and the impact it will have on what people think about us, whether they think we're taking the piss or not. That's why I've kind of held back on us even talking about having like a PO box or anything, because I wouldn't want people just to send us things thinking, 
this is an in for us or it's a business, whatever, blah, 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 or that we're taking the piss. If people were to send us stuff as they have done, sure. I would want it to be daft stuff. Like, and it has been so far, it's been great. Yeah. Who doesn't want whiskey in a bag through the mail? Exactly. And it's been like, not a, we'll enjoy that behind the scenes and then talk about it another time. It's been, no, look, look what's here. Yeah, the way I see um, sponsorships in the show is um, I wouldn't want anybody that's watching on the Monday Night Guitar Geek Club to look at um, the things that we're getting to do this show and go, well, it's it's them behind the screen and then me over here not really getting much out of this. Like, mm -hmm. the only reason we're taking gear and things from, from companies is because we put in a lot of time in order to make this show. We have to sit here for two hours to have a comment. I say have to, like it's hard work, but we have a conversation. Then afterwards, I'm going to have to sit for a couple of hours and edit this show. Yep. And then Monday Night Guitar Geek Club's going to come around and I'm going to sit there for two hours and watch that. Um, so all in all, even if I take no time outside of the initial doing of those things, that's six hours of work a week that I'm that I'm putting into totally. um, the podcast totally. type thing. So this is just making me feel a little bit better for spending six hours a week on stuff. Totally. Um, but it's it's your show as much as it is ours, guys. So this, um, this is a reward for working hard and enjoying what we're doing. Yeah. It's not an incentive to work hard. Yeah. Uh, 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 is that Great a way. fair way to put it? Perfect we're, way to put we're, it. We're not only doing this because we have this. Yeah. We did. We started the podcast just as two dickheads with microphones talking shit. Yeah. And we've went for there. Yeah. And uh, we're still two dickheads with microphones. We're just lucky enough. There's a couple of. We've bands. just got nicer microphones now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and uh, uh, some some friends. Yeah. In the business and uh, yeah. the music industry. And if in we business. had a PO box and people were sending us stuff, it would never be like, oh, I can't wait to go to the PO box and see what stuff I've got. If I don't have two sets of Yeezys, I will be so yeah. upset. It would be going to a PO box to go. I can't wait to see what things we can talk about on the show Aye, what I'm, stuff I'm we can have fun with what's with. going to come out of this box exactly so um, yeah I think that's a, a great way to end the, show, end the show so yes. Mike until next time like and subscribe and send us money get on bye fuckers <laughs>